Gathering the Nations with Gathering Jessica Ariane. Yes. All right. Hallelujah. Let's see and make sure first before we get started, make sure that my mic is good. I see you all in the chat room. Shalom, everybody. It's Wednesday night and we are continuing in our weekly Bible study, although we've skipped a week. Um, I think that's working out a little better uh, to sort of broadcast every other week or as I'm able. Uh, but nonetheless, we have a jam packed presentation for you tonight, even though, again, very small portion. We only have three chapters. Genesis 25 through 27. There's a lot going on there. And again, we're going to talk about terms that you may not be accustomed to or even familiar with. So I want to make sure that I go slow enough so that you can absorb the information, but also keep it flowing so that you can stay connected. Um, so before we get started, you know, I was, again, as I was putting everything together and sort of editing all that I have, um, I was considering what the Bible is and what it is not. Someone asked me, from my last presentation, why I have decided, or at least why I want to stop calling uh, the word of our the word of our covenant, right? The words of our covenant. Why I want to stop calling it the Bible, to Biblia, uh, or Biblos, uh, the books, because again, it's it really does frame or shape your perspective or your mindset regarding the scriptures. You know, it has been passed on to us to perceive the Bible as a book. Uh, as though it's a literary book in which we are uh, reading through a narrative and there's chapters and verses that we cite uh, information from. But I don't, not that that's done harm, obviously it got us here, but I think we can do one better. I think that when we begin to see the Bible, not as a book, but as a test state will and record of succession, I think it will, again, frame our mind when we delve in, when we begin to study it, it will help us to see the chronological account of the rise and fall of nations. Um, you know, the, these, this account is acting as a witness of a time that we were not privileged to, but again, acting as a witness between the government of men and the government of Yahuwah the again the scriptures the written word is also codified law codified meaning codexed or code it means it was inscribed somewhere or somehow that it was written down and so therefore uh, that writing sent it into what is now called history so it becomes historical as in codified law or a written account this codified law would then include case law, which we can, um, you know, resort to for information or again, uh, to access these, these annals, these, uh, you know, ca these case by case situations that give to us the, the heart of the father that reveal the heart of the creator and his wisdom in right ruling. Um, we also see that the law that was given to Moses to govern the children morally, uh, spiritually, physically, and in every way to keep them um, sustained was a law that was superior to all other laws. It really made the laws of men inferior, subjugating all other laws. Uh, the Bible, as we have called it for so long, um, is in fact a deed title. It's a deed trust uh, to uh, showing this royal grant, this gift, this promissory note. Again, we see that both in the natural and the spiritual. We see the the uh, right rulings, the shoftims, the judgments, the ordinances, all of these things as part of the constitution, not necessarily of only Israel, but the constitution of human morality. And that's really what we're looking at here are the moral obligations to love one another, and to allow the spirit of Elohim to rule through us or to move through us in the face of conflict. We also know that the writings, uh, again, known as the Bible so far, are records. It's a record of events. We see record of events, again, in the form of what we now know as history or telling a story. 
but it's a record of events. It goes from the beginning, there's a beginning point, and then there's an end point. And what is being documented is the conflicts of men. You know, I began to think about um, the battle between good and evil and how we have given uh, you know, power to an entity that I'm not quite sure is deserving of it, that being Satan, this fallen uh, angel and his, you know, minions. But really, I, I don't think that they deserve uh, the attention that we give to him and his minions. What I do think the issue is here uh, is that Yahuwah is more concerned about wrestling with man than he is about wrestling with, you know, demons and, and uh, demigogans, you know, all of these, you know, dark forces of, of wickedness, which in reality is so simple. The light truly does conquer darkness. So I don't think that that's a feat in which Yah has exhausted himself. I think instead the creator, again, loving his creation, sees the heart of of his creation, understands the weakness of its frame and desires to bring it into a place of, of wellness and wholeness. And again, the wrestling or the conflict truly then lies between Yah and his creation, uh, in this case, mankind. That That's really what we're looking at when we read the scriptures. That's why there's very little mention of demons and sorcery and, and all of these things, uh, entities, in fact, that, uh, that the writers, the early writers um, men, made mention of because again, Again, it was the, basically the, the will of the man, the flesh that wars against uh, the ways of Yahweh. And again, this points even to Yahusha's rule and reign as we conquer the flesh, uh, thereby overthrowing the power of Satan uh, because he can only work against the weakness of the flesh. So back to my little, you know, meditation moment here was usually how I introduced the uh, present, the lecture for the week is with some so, sort of meditation in, uh, or consideration of mine. So again, I was considering what is this and what is it not? Let's clarify. So again, going back to the written scriptures or the words of our covenant, uh, what else is it? It's a record of events. Again, documenting the conflict of men and final resolutions. We see resolutions all throughout the uh, written, uh, again, what do you want to call it? You want to call it the codified book of law? You want to call it uh, the words of your testament, the words of your covenant? Whatever the case may be, we do see constant solutions to problems where Yah, again, is saying that, you know, this is how you can remedy a matter. Come, you know, really ultimately uh, being resolved in uh, the uh, working or overthrow of the flesh. And we see the perfecting of, of these solutions being overthrow your flesh, overcome sin, right? Deal with the flesh. Sin is the problem. And it, Yahusha is the final solution. We see that total final solution and victory. That's what we would call victories, victories, constant victories, which is again, uh, you see good conquering uh, evil or deviation. So I, what I will say is that it's definitely not. What is it not? So it's definitely not a superstitious book of mysteries or hidden esoteric knowledge that somehow is going to foretell the future. In fact, when we get into the parts of prophecy, we will begin to see that uh, everything that is prophesied is prophesied around the covenant words, uh, the oaths that were created and self-imprecating oaths or oaths that imprecate judgment and, and um, um, again, part of the right rulings. But we'll see that all of prophecy really does have a foundation in what was already already written so it's as do this then this it's causative right it's a cause a, a as causation so we see do this and this don't do this and this so we see that there's a cause and effect so we know that it's not something that we can um, try to pull esoteric knowledge from it's truth is not hidden it's not hidden um it is it is hidden from the flesh because the flesh does not desire to know the truth but it's not hidden in the in the sense that yah would make it difficult for us to find it and say well you know it was your fault that you didn't search hard enough uh no the truth is plain it's simple 
We know that it's not a mythological book. And in the sense that it does this, the, the book, right? That it's not mythology. It's not, it doesn't elevate. It shouldn't elevate uh, demigods and demons and fallen angels as worthy opponents of Yahuwah. I've come to the conclusion that none of these agents of darkness are worthy opponents. They are not worthy opponents of Yahuwah. He is not concerned about these entities, although he deals with him them they are already defeated they are already they're from a state of defeat they are in a position of defeat they cannot come out of that place they will have no victory whatever victory they assume is again presumptuous it, it rests in the imagination of their mind and this is why yah laughs but nonetheless again yah is more concerned about his creation he's got a he's got a, a goal here he's working out something okay so it's not a, again, a mythological book uh, that, you know, shows that these vast gods that rose up against the mighty Elohim, uh, Yahweh, and, and overthrow the dominion, and there's this battle raging, like, it's not, no, it's not that, <laughs> it's really not. Um, yet what I find is that so many throughout the course of time so many have um drifted on these nonsensical theories debates dogmas i mean there's so much contention around these concepts um, by which people actually define their faith and what i find is that in the lives of those people they are really truly never grounded in victory or, nor do they have the demonstration of power or authority. They're constantly vying for it. They only seem to have what I would consider a gross interpretation of these things. Uh, the narrative of truth, in, in my opinion, the narrative of truth is simple and it's easy to bear. Uh, the truth is also invigorating, making alive the souls of men. Uh, with that being said, uh, we will start our presentation tonight um you know the truth is what sets us free and again the narrative of truth it, it is a living thing um it is alive and active and uh, it's moving on our behalf for those who love it they will bear it they will desire it they will search for it like silver and gold it's worth it it's worth it all right let's get started hallelujah thank you father again for another night we get to come together and study your word we get to look into the the words of our covenant the contract uh, that binds us to you it holds us accountable but guess what it also holds him accountable accountable if you um saw my post this week i posted something in the in the uh community section uh it was basically um a commentary on it was a fact actually something that i discovered about the nature of yahuwah uh, he's compensatory he has a compensatory nature what does that mean it means that yahuwah does not require that you give something without you also expecting something in return uh, the relationship that we enter into with our creator was always created to be harmonious and reciprocal that means that in order for us to thrive as his counterpartners or his co-regent um his companions uh then we need to understand the element of his nature he desires he says you have not because you ask not he desires to compensate us for any losses that we may have incurred as a result of following him uh one of those things once somebody i loved it somebody responded and said you know uh the only thing i lost that was of value at all was myself and i am my old self and i really don't want that back well that's great but if you really stop and analyze what you just said then the anticipation uh, for a reward or compensation is there. You said your old self, then that would assume that you become a new creature, a new person. That's part of the compensation. So you yielded or surrendered your old nature and expected, maybe you didn't, but nonetheless, you received in return in lieu of, as compensation, a new nature. A new nature that experiences joy without getting high, that experiences freedom um, from addictions and bondages, um, at least aspires to. Maybe some of you are new in this walk and you're still struggling uh, to... Uh, struggling under the yoke or the burden of addiction but nonetheless there is hope i assure you many of us especially in our chat room can attest to the freedom that we have experienced um, as a result of putting our trust and our hope in the sovereign 
uh, yeah, Yahuwah, our Elohim. He's sovereign and um, he is faithful. Um, you know, you may be tempted to lose heart uh, or to become despondent or hope uh, to, to lack hope because again, time persists and you're like, wow, how long shall I deal with this? You know, sometimes we focus on the problem uh, rather than keeping our eyes or attention on him so that he can show us those little foxes, those things that are otherwise hidden, which are usually at the root of the problem. So oftentimes you'll find that it's not the drug, it's not the food, it's not the thing that you think, it's the fruit that's being produced from you, it's not that. Usually there's a root that's hidden. And that's why, again, it requires that you be still, keep your eyes on the Father and get into his word, get excited about his word because in his word is power, it's life, it's a living thing it's a living thing and um it's how he speaks to us all right where are we today all of our bible students uh glad to have you here tonight tonight we titled this chapter uh these chapters the heritage covenant maybe something you're not familiar with maybe everybody has only ever said torah 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 well you know there's so much more than simply the laws i mean what about the aspect of a covenant isn't that really i mean if you think about it in the form of a marriage you think well are you constantly when you're dealing with conflict and you're and you're struggling to um to become you know unified with your partner or you're figuring things out in the beginning of that relationship you're not going to sit there and say the vows the vows the vows it's the vows it's the vows you promise you promise you promise you promise these vows these vows these vows no but it's the relationship the marriage the marriage the marriage the marriage the marriage <laughs> it's the promise it's the commitment it's the love it's the affirmation it's the uh, compromises that are made it's all the things you go through um after realistically speaking most people get their vows and put them away i can assure you if i asked most of you right now what are the vows that you promised what did you promise to your significant other most people can't really recall all of them right that can maybe a few but because it's again it's not about the, the 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 emphasis is not on the detail of the vows but about the commitment that you made to one another to work these things out for better for for life you know f again to to multiply to be fruitful so we're going to look at the aspect of our covenant in 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 regard to a heritage and i'll bring some definitions to light today i hope you got a pen and paper ready uh because we're going to get uh we're going to get uh we're going to study um really study all right let's get started here um again we're in genesis chapter 25 through 27 and i i will start um let me share my screen here see if I can do that for you praise you and you know it was a full moon we had a full moon for those of you who are um, counting the days uh, to Passover this month um, as I am um, we just had a full moon and that whole eclipse thing that that was I missed it I was like I wanted to at least see it live or something but you know I was just like well, 15 minutes in um, we missed it but I don't think I missed much anyways again not giving too much credit to the things that are happening in the world around us. But I'm, I'm more fascinated about what Yah is showing us in this particular season and time. I assure you, my I know that my perspective has changed drastically. And I'm talking like in the moment of the twinkling of the eye, in the moment of time, my perspective went from 10 years, well, 20 years of like perceiving things from a very religious perspective, a very, you know, uh, superstitious, you know, ethereal, oh, spiritual, to a very concrete, solid foundation that is actually giving to me um, a confidence that doesn't come from uh, accolades or accomplishments, uh, a confidence that doesn't come from, um, you know, the boat boasting uh, of of your success or you know boasting it doesn't come from the applaud or approval of men it's something that's internalized it's something that's it's like an anchor and it would become weighty i feel really heavy uh, really weighty really solid and that's again because i have uh he's opened my eyes to these things that would otherwise to most people just seem like uh scholastic but yet even though i'm learning these things along with you guys um what i see is the spiritual aspect to it as well. I just don't see it as something that's so unattainable now. I see that, wow, 
oh my goodness, like it's so linear. I'm like, wow. So the letter and the spirit, they really do, they really work together and it's attainable. It's not something again that's lofty. It's not something that, you know, uh, exists in, in the recesses or the suspension of the mind. It really is something that's right here, right now, a tangible expression of what was in the natural becomes expressive in the spiritual. And again, the transformation of your mind means that your paradigm or your perspective is shifted, that you begin to perceive not only uh, rightly, you know, you, you, you see things rightly uh, and that, but that, that seeing things rightly would include that you see him rightly and you see yourself rightly. And then that helps you to perceive others properly and to deal with those things properly. All right, let's get started. All right, so we're, again, we're starting in Genesis chapter 25 through 27. I'm going to start here with the heritage blessing. What is a heritage blessing? Let's talk about it. So uh, starting in Genesis 48 through uh, verse 4, it says, Behold, and again, we see this reiterated from the beginning all the way to the end, right? Where Yahweh, uh, Yahusha does in fact bring uh, this uh, to a fruition, to a head. He brings it uh, to a complete end head so in genesis 40 it says behold i will make you fruitful i will multiply you i will make you a multitude of peoples and will give this land to your descendants after you as an everlasting possession okay so a heritage uh, blessing cur currently today if we were to look up at the definition of heritage uh covenant or blessing it would be basically defined as a voluntary agreement that is agreed to by a property owner and we talked about this a ben a benefactor is an owner somebody who owns something and is able to then bequeath it or give it to someone else or even to lease it or to rent it under certain terms and conditions because he's the owner well that would be yeah right he's the owner He's the owner of all the things that he gives. So again, the voluntary agreement that is agreed to by a property owner for the purpose of protecting and conserving resources. So it's some form of uh, conservation. And so if you think about that, the, back in the beginning, start from the beginning, when Yahuwah created the man, he gave him all the necessary elements. He provided for him all the resources that were required to conserve him, to conserve life right? It's part of the conservation of life. Then you, you even see throughout the course of time that Yahuwah also uh, creates a reciprocal relationship, not just between him and his creation, but also creation and creation. We see again that parity uh, treatment, that mean, I'm sorry, that parity treaty and that suzerain vassal treaty, again, where he finds himself caring for, cultivating the earth, um, nourishing, not just taxing or taking from it, uh, but having uh, to labor in the fields to tend to the needs of the earth. Uh, we see that that is something that is a uh, uh, is supposed to be a gift. It said that he was supposed to be, you know, he was put in this place called the garden. Uh, and the, the name of that place was Eden, which means pleasure. So really he should have derived pleasure, efficacy perhaps, feeling self-sufficient, feeling accomplished, knowing that uh, he was the fruit of his hand right the labor in which he was producing was part, was part of his sufficiency was part of his livelihood so we see that's a beautiful concept in which yahuwah has in fact the creator has in fact created us uh again to and given us uh, uh, provisions as part of the conservation of mankind but also to conserve the resources so we see again that harmonious relationship right so i want you to keep that in mind uh, as we continue to go through so you notice that in verse 4 or 48, Genesis 48, he says, as an everlasting. Now, does that mean forever beyond the space of time? No, I think in the fact in the past we looked at the concept of time, we didn't delve into it deeply, but we have a basic uh, concept uh, or working knowledge of time. So I, I think I've mentioned this before also. 
when we see everlasting, it's primarily speaking of a heritage or something that is consecutive. And in this case, it would be generational. It's something you inherit. Think of a heritage. You inherit. So again, it's going to, the everlasting possession is not speaking of beyond space and time, um, but a part of the continuum within the space and time that we exist. So from generation to generation to generation and to generation, again, we see a glimpse of eternity there. We see a glimpse of the father of the creator as he has created mankind to live in a, in succession in gener from generation to generation to regenerate to be able to regenerate we see that even today um indicated as uh, through sleep the concept of sleep every night we go to sleep and we are regenerated that's what's happening you wake up and you're regenerated this is why the uh, the words of our covenant in the testimonies we see that sleep is usually used synonymously or idiomatically um uh, synonymously with death as an idiomatic expression of a form or a type of death okay so it can be ignorance it could be the dimming of the eyes whatever the case may be but every morning we were regenerated right that's why we thank him every morning his mercies are new every morning but we also see the ultimate uh everlasting the concept of everlasting in the work of yahushua as he was uh formally raised from the dead we see that we that there is a another place beyond uh this place there is something else beyond this space and time and so um, we're looking at regeneration here. So part of the heritage blessing includes regeneration. That's extremely important because again, when we go back to the beginning, it starts with the seed. And the seed is when it has the genetic components, when it has the power of the Ruach HaKodesh in it, and it was the seed of Yahuwah, it has that regenerative power. While the word of Yahuwah is the seed. That's why when we get that word, I don't care what you're studying, when you're studying with the Ruach, when you set some time apart and it's you and him and you're just really he's your tutor right and you're under the tutelage of the holy spirit i assure you that that word will not return void it will set its course in you when you have a desire to search with him to walk with him uh to be a companion uh in this life of yours to have him as a companion i assure you that it will not be in vain uh, whatever you're cultivating will bring forth a harvest and so i assure you that again this is an indication we're looking at who is he and why has he done this so from the beginning we see that tutelage i'm sorry not tutelage we see that heritage okay um give me just a second here okay so we see that um yahuwah has in fact sown a seed and again that seed has the ability to produce after its own kind throughout the course of time regenerating so that's part of the heritage okay and remember everlasting that is to be fruitful that again to to recall to cultivate that you're not working or living in vain it, it, it has a sense of being uh, able to multiply to to reproduce without your effort right you just put it in the ground and it does what it's supposed to do um, but it requires this land as surety so what's the point of having a seed if you ain't got no land right where are you going to put it so you this land the land was always tied to this heritage blessing the land was important and it's important to also note that the land was a gift we talked about this and it's really akin to various things there's various things in scripture that you can use or see symbolically um tied to the land for example any possession the land was a a possession but so was the woman a woman was a possession um i know that sounds kind of wrong but i think um some of the things that i'm going to say in the future uh perhaps we're not ready for them but as i continue to sort of remove some of the uh, restraints that have been placed upon us that prevent us from really see things seeing things the way the father created them um i think that as those restraints are removed uh when i do say certain things you're not going to be shocked <laughs> uh when you know when i say that uh, women Women were a possession children were a possession they were they were owned um, the concept of ownership is foreign to us again as a human being how can you be owned but again we need to redefine these terms I assure you 
Uh, even slavery carries a negative connotation when in fact it wasn't. It was surety in the ancient Near East. It was a way to make sure that there was no vagrancy, that there was no homelessness, uh, that there was a, a constant surplus of resources uh, for all. Um, maybe people didn't maintain the same tier as others, uh, but nonetheless, um, you know, these contracts and covenants uh, were created and allowed in order to make sure that a man, again, the self-sufficiency was able to provide for his family. So that's part of the heritage as well. So the idea ultimately in why Yah is, is from the beginning to the end, um, what we see working through the testimony is basically a living hope. We see this hope is alive through each generation and that this hope would spawn from one seed to the next, eventually becoming innumerable, innumerable. And so that's the promise that he gives to Abraham is that his seed would be innumerable. And um, that is really the ultimate, the maxim of, of, you know, proliferation, you know, becoming massive or great. It's beautiful. It's a concept that only, you know, the spirit can help us understand. All right, so I'm going to give you an example here in Psalm 127.3. You know, it speaks of children. Now, this is a really beautiful concept of a heritage because it says that children are, in fact, a heritage of Yahuwah. Again, let's look at it. This everlasting possession. Well, yes, because when you think about a child, the offspring or the offshoot of the union right? Between two, male and female are required, but it's the offshoot or the offspring. And part of the promise to continue at that um, continuity. So children represent continuity, okay? So we know that we're truly in the last days or the conclusion of these last days, the finale, because we see a spirit that has uh, rose up, right? In, in, our, in the face uh, of Yahweh, the spirit has rose up in rebellion. And it's really the flesh of man that says a man can be a woman and a woman can be a man. All the gender uh, dysmorphia and the arguments about uh, gender, whatever you want to call it. But we see that that really is a bold statement that says, you know, um, really it is, it is it's a strike against the children. It really is. Because two men cannot conceive and two women cannot conceive. We're just going to put adoption aside for right now. But they can't. Two men can't and two women can't. And the idea that they would bring up for argument's sake, the um, the idea for of a woman being barren, well, that's not, statistically speaking, that's not a problem. That's not a real problem that we suffer from here in America. Um, yes, there are individuals, women, uh, there are women who uh, maybe have some sort of issue, uh, but it doesn't mean that they weren't born with the potential to bring forth life. It just means that something went wrong. So they do not set the standard uh, for procreation. But nonetheless, when we think about that spirit that has uh, rose up in this hour, we think about, again, um, the, the, the perverseness, the crookedness that strays away from the dynamic in which Yahuwah created to fulfill this heritage, to be an emblem for the continuity of life. Children, children were a heritage and should be, always will be, again, the hope. That, that's why, again, back then in the days, uh, ancient days, famine and barrenness wasn't was common it was extremely common uh, because the environment was hostile so the womb was hostile uh, again the woman being tied to the land the womb of the earth right that that you put something in and you bring something out it's the seed that goes in and the you know cultivated and it brings forth fruit same thing with a woman very important to understand the beautiful concepts of man and woman and children and again the family dynamic okay it says here, children are a heritage of Yahuwah. They are the fruit of the womb. A reward, it says, as they become the recipients of their parents' estate. So again, looking from that perspective, that children are the reward of the womb. They're the, the, that's something that bursts forth. It's, it's interesting because right away I thought about how the curse that was placed upon the woman was that she would suffer in childbearing. 
mm, she would suffer. You know, and then again, I started to think about how it was very common for a woman to be barren at that time. And could that be the sorrow or the suffering that woman would, women would experience? It would be the same. Maybe you're not barren. Maybe you do have children. But many of us have children that we bore perhaps in our ignorance or we bore um, prior to, you know, being being delivered or brought into this relationship with Yah. And so we see our children are struggling uh, with the ways of this world. We see a lot of our children have gone astray. So this is still a barrenness it's just spiritual barrenness so there's there's sorrow there there's sorrow so again i'm not sure that it's necessarily the uh physical i mean that's obviously childbearing and pain most children died back then but i think more of the spiritual aspect of sorrow placed upon the woman as she sees that her seed was in vain or that her children live lives that are in vain and how many of us um cry out for our children for Yah to have mercy upon them as they spend their inheritance right all right so let's look at some words here so we have the word here for heritage which is um 51 59 in the strongs and it's the word nahala and heritage basically speaks of the property that's given as a legacy so this is in regard to children okay so children he's saying are something given as a legacy portion it also speaks of a blessing, an occupant or a recipient of a gift. And it comes from 5157, which means distributed, divided, or a portion. So Yahuwah portions out, or he distributes this gift accordingly, even as the land was divided, distributed, and given out as portions to uh, the various tribes, okay? So children are also given as a gift by Yahuwah, as their portion or their blessing in order to maintain the legacy of the parents. This is why it's important for us to um, be able to acquire possessions, not just in the natural, but the spiritual, so that we can leave a legacy for our children. Now, Ezekiel 46 is a good example of that concept. Um, I encourage you to write that down and go read it. See what it says, Ezekiel 46, um, speaking of the heritage blessing. Let me go there for a second. I don't know if y'all can see, it looks kind of dark, but. Praise you. Yeah. Okay, well, I don't know why I didn't put the rest of the, <laughs> I don't know why I didn't put the rest of the verse, but uh, Ezekiel 46, I don't know, go read <laughs> Ezekiel 46. Sorry about that. Okay, let's go. All right, so Ezekiel, um, no, no, uh, reward. So let's look at this word. So we have heritage, property given as a legacy, a portion or a blessing, a gift distributed. So we're still looking at Psalm uh, 127.3. Um, so because we're going to see that Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, right? We're going to see that the seed, uh, a, uh, Jacob, Isaac, they also uh, are part of that heritage blessing. It's not just about the acquisition of land, but it is also the bearing of the seed. It is to bring forth that heir so that they could possess the land, so that they could receive the gift. So it's the same with salvation. Remember, salvation is, in fact, a gift that is given. It's not something that you can earn because it's a gift and it's not something you can buy because it's a gift, okay? So it says here that uh, if you read that verse 127.3, it says that they are the fruit of the, the womb, a reward. So the word reward is sakar, and it means payment, compensation, or wages. So even as Yahuwah is a reward, he says to Abraham in Genesis 15.1, He's a reward to those who are faithful, um, that his presence remains with those who are faithful. Uh, he told Abraham, I am your exceedingly and great reward. What a concept, what a gift. Well, in James 1.15, it says, then after desire speaking of sin, this is the contrast to life, those who are faithful. Well, this is what the unfaithful or the wicked, what, this is their reward, unfortunately. It says, then after desire has conceived, right, it gives birth to sin. And sin, when it is full grown, gives birth to death. 
So we see the contrast there that faith and obedience lead to life because Yahuwah is present. He is the source of life. So there then is the gift of salvation. There is life. And that's why the only way you can truly receive salvation is through faith. And that faith uh, leads to your desire to obey. It's obedience, to go his way, to do right before him. Um, uh, so yeah, so faith and obedience, those are two of the stipulations required uh, to receive salvation. And salvation basically is his presence. It's he's life. It's life and more, uh, more abundant, right? So in Romans 6, 22 through 23, it says, the fruit you reap, again, speaking of those who, who refuse uh, the hegemony of Yahuwah, refuse to yield or submit to him and will uh, de are determined to go their own way. They're determined to be their own gods. And so 6, 22 through 23 says, the fruit you reap leads to holiness. That would be us. And the outcome is eternal life. You see, for the wages of sin is death, but the gift of Yahuwah is eternal life. So again, as desire is conceived, it gives birth to sin, and sin, when it is full grown, gives birth to death. But for us, the fruit that we reap leads to holiness, the fruit of the womb, the fruit of the womb, part of the legacy, our legacy, as we continue to sow in, in, in the spirit, as we continue to abide in the spirit, as we obey and we follow and we submit and we trust and we believe and we do all the things, what we end up producing is holiness and that set apartness or that rightness, right ruling the outcome of it is eternal life or it is life the opposite would be the reward the payment the compensation or the wages of sin and sin when it is full grown leads to death okay so you can see that uh, part of that contrast right again he has sown into us by his spirit his spirit has been given to us, that liveliness, uh, in order to make us fruitful. In what? In righteousness, in order to multiply us. In what? In faith, in hope, in trust, in order for us to continue as part of the continent continuity, okay? So now another word, so we saw heritage there as 5159, meaning the property that is given for a legacy. So another word uh, that I thought was interesting for heritage, it's the word morasha, it's 41, 81, and 80. And it means a possession. And this is what I was talking about earlier as children are a possession. So it comes from the root word yarash, which means to occupy um, by driving out previous tenants. So to occupy something, so again pointing to the continuity of the seed from the beginning to the end ensuring victory over foreign invaders and a final end time harvest can you hold on for a second i'm sorry all right so again uh ensuring an end time so the continuity of the seed from the beginning to the end, ensuring victory over foreign invaders and a final end time harvest, because ultimately that's the end result, right? That was the goal from the beginning. It's already finished, already in motion, nothing the enemy can do. Therefore, the enemy, which we will look at in the flesh, let's just focus on the flesh, the flesh wars against the spirit. So the enemy, primarily the flesh, has pursued the seed, striving to abort it, to interrupt its duration and continuation. So some notes I have here for myself. Let me explain that. So we see that from the beginning, Yahuwah has sown a seed and that seed will not return void. And from the beginning, from his word, he has prophesied that there will be one who will come from the woman who will be able to subjugate uh, the serpent's seed, the seed of destruction or the seed of the liar, right? The false one. And so as a result, we see that the truth is what he was speaking about. The truth will prevail over the lie. And so ultimately that's what we see. That's why Yahushua says that the truth shall set you free. Well, what it does when we have the word of Yahuwah in us, the sole purpose of that word working in us is to solidify us. It's to make us firm and to make us complete so that it helps us to resist foreign invaders. What does that mean? 
that means that it, it allows us to recognize the enemy and to uh, gird up so that we don't allow, just like the woman in the garden, allow these foreign words, these lies, we are able to discern them. And so it protects the, uh, the, it protects our being. It's like fences and gates and borders. So ultimately we see that that part of that possession was the idea was that Yah would create a seed in order to occupy, to occupy what the enemy has done. So the enemy came in, usurped mankind, took possession, right? And enslaved mankind through the lust of his flesh, tempting him with sin, keeping him indebted as a slave, and as a result, building his own empire and kingdom here on earth through the, the weakness of the flesh, through the weakness of man, and by the fear of death. So we see that death was ruling and reigning for a very long time. So the conquest has always been to try to wipe out the seed of Yahuwah, to abort the seed, or at least to interrupt its duration, to prevent its continuity. So we see this is why even with Pharaoh, uh, who slaughtered the children, the sons, we see this also with Yahusha's time to do the same. And we see this even now as the workers or the physical agents of darkness are working um intensely to try to create some sort of uh you know agenda that will help them wipe out we even see that abortion is also a byproduct of that attempt all right so we're looking at children we're looking at the seed we're looking in the natural we're looking at the spiritual now we're going to move on to our actual study so in Genesis 25, now again, I'm not going to go over chapter by chapter. I encourage you, I hopefully y'all read it. Y'all read Genesis chapter 25 through 27, so you know what's going on. I'm just going to break down a few things, and let me see if I can get um, my notes and my e-sort up for you side by side. All right, we got it. We can do all things. All right, so here we go. Genesis 25, we're talking about a generational covenant. And what's happening here is Abraham's death and his descendants. And again, I explained to you what we're actually looking at here is a will and testament, okay? So it's documenting. We're actually, I'm actually going to present on who wrote the Bible and the canon of scripture. And when we do, it's pretty interesting. But, uh, and then I'm still going to present on slavery, even though I'm giving it to you little by little, um, so that it's not so much information all at once. But what's happening here is that, um, we see that we're looking at the descendants here. And so basically it talks about uh, Abraham taking on another wife. And a couple of verses later, it talks about that wife perhaps being a concubine, or it could be that he had also engaged with concubines and had children. But what's mentioned here is not the sons of these concubines, if there were concubines, but only the sons of Keturah. So Keturah, the sons of Keturah, um, of all the sons that are mentioned, I'm going to focus quickly on one, um, Midian, who will eventually become the head of the Midianites. Um, interesting to note that his name means brawling or contention or strife. Well, again, this points back to what I said earlier, that we will see constantly throughout the testimony or through the chronology of conflict, uh, the uh, witness of conflict, we see that the flesh, those that were not born of promise, um, all the brothers of the sons of Noah that were not of the promise of, of Shem's line, we see that there was constantly strife. There was constant strife. There was constant brawling. There was constant um, conflict, okay? Um, but even internally as well, uh, but really the, the wars against flesh and blood. So Midian means to brawl, to be contentious, and to strife. Well, later on, we find out that Midian helped Balak hire Balaam. Uh, we know that Moses eventually vexes and smites them. Uh, these individuals, the house of Midian, were the ones who sold Joseph to the Ishmaelites um, and then to the Egyptians. Um, or to the Egyptians, to the Ishmaelites. Uh, Moses, while he was a stranger or a gur in exile, dwelt in Midian. 
Uh, we know that he, it's interesting. So it says that he was a stranger there. And the word that's used is gur. We looked at this word several times. For example, Hagar, she was a gur. She was a stranger. Lot was a gur. He was a stranger. Abraham was a gur. He was a stranger. It means foreigner someone in exile. So uh, Moses was indeed a stranger. He dwelt in exile while in Midian. Um, there he married Zipporah, the daughter of Jethro, who was also a Midianite priest. And so that this uh, the reason why I bring this up is because uh, we will see in the, uh, later on in a few more chapters, we were, we're going to see um, Jethro comes in and gives some wise counsel to Moses and it would make sense that he would know of Yahuwah and it's because uh, he's a descendant of Abraham's. So through Keturah, he would have been, uh, his family line would have uh, been raised in the way. We know this because Yahuwah commends Abraham by saying, that Abraham has indeed raised his sons up in the way. So despite what they did with that information or how they twisted or perverted it um, or exploited it, they were still raised up accordingly, uh, even as Isaac was, even as Ishmael was, even as uh, these other sons would have been. So they did have loosely, um, again, we don't know because he became a priest uh, unto other gods, but we know, or the gods of Midian, I, uh, Midian but we do know that he would have had some recollection of the El of Yahuwah. So there, Moses calls his firstborn Gershom. Ger, again, meaning a stranger there. And this is interesting because it would really, in my opinion, marks the irony of Moses because Moses is called to liberate the children from a land that is not their own. So um, he's really he's a gur he calls his son a gur he understands what it means to not have uh, a territory and to be uh, subject to the uh, governance or the rule of a brother or another he they fully understood these concepts it was not foreign to them so liberty so liberty he understood the task he knew what he was called to do okay so now in verse again we're in genesis 25 speaking of a generational covenant Verses five and six as we move on. So here it says, making mention of his inheritance, it says that Isaac receives all of Abraham's possessions while the sons of Keturah, give me just a second here. Let me see if I can pull up my notes. While the sons of Keturah uh, were given gifts and then they were sent away. So I thought, okay, this is interesting. What's going on here? And this would then warrant a few more definitions. Let's go. So we're going to break it down. So it says that um, the sons of Keturah received gifts and they were sent away from Isaac. And we'll explain that reasoning in just a minute. Why were they sent away? Is this a custom? Remember Ishmael was also sent away. Is he just replicating or redu uh, re reproducing or, you know, uh, doing what he did with Ishmael? Uh, no, I think there's really um, another issue here and it has something to do with he, he gets it. Abraham gets it. Abraham understands that that Isaac is indeed the heir. Uh, it's not that his other sons will not receive a portion or an inheritance, but it's that there's something specifically that Isaac has been designated for and that he gets it now. He gets it. He understands that it's uh, something beyond uh, what would be acquired in the natural or established in the natural. So a, um, let's look at this word. So it says that he gives them gifts. Here we go right here. It gives them gifts. And so the word for gift here is the word uh, matana. And it's connected to the word natan, which is again, natan, which is what the land was, a gift. But here it means, listen to this, compensation or support. And you know, a lot of the rules and regulations, a lot of the jurisdictions, the laws that we uh, exist by here in the U.S. really are rooted in uh, the Mosaic laws or the early ancient um, legal systems. So when we think about, you know, child support, when we think about a, um, a divorce, when it, when a divorce happens and how there has to be, uh, or usually a judge will re require that a husband pay alimony or some sort of compensation. So this was actually what was happening here. 
he was um, giving to his sons support and compensation and then he sent them out accordingly okay um it wasn't a cruel act there was a reason he the part of that conservation or preservation of something he was preserving his son from the conflict that could arise he was preserving his son from being um accosted or being challenged or his his legitimacy being challenged because it would have been a legal challenge it would have been uh, a challenge that um would have been upheld if he allowed them to remain um in the presence of isaac um isaac could have uh, been forced to concede uh, but uh, so he is he's securing the throne he's securing uh, the legacy it's beautiful um, but it does not this in no way should suggest that Abraham was being cruel and neglecting his sons or uh, uh, rejecting them as valuable it's not the case that's why again I wanted to focus on compensation and support in Ezekiel 46 16 through 17 um, a gift of inheritance is mentioned, and it's this word matana. And again, it gives us a better understanding of what's happening. It says, a gift of inheritance. This is what Yahuwah says. If a prince gives a gift unto any of his sons, the inheritance thereof shall be his sons. It shall be their possession by inheritance. Well, what is this word inheritance? And the word inheritance is nahala, and it means property. So he gave them property. Uh, again, he couldn't necessarily give them the land because the land he was on on a grant. He was uh, he was a tenant, a foreigner. Um, remember, he was um, in the land of Canaan as a gur right under the hegemony of abimelech which was a philistine or a hittite so he was granted uh, but he did give him a portion of his um property his his resources whatever the case may be and then sent them on their way uh so it must have been a a, a large region but more i mean whatever the, the obviously the midianites and whatnot they settled in certain places in canaan uh, but I don't know, we don't know exactly at that moment how far they ventured out when they, when he did send them out. But the idea is that again, he's not disowning them. He is releasing them, giving them their inheritance. It says here that it's property given by means of a will or as a heritage, part of the legacy. It's a portion of state or blessing, something called in state that is to to instate something to put or place in a certain state or position as in an office that is to install or to endow so he he sent them out well endowed he put them in a position of influence and good standing he sent them out uh, with again these gifts i want you to really see that it was more than just gifts he was he was bestowing upon them uh the uh, opportunity to excel again what they chose to do with those things we see later on is folly right because again as they deviated or strayed from their father's elohim they did in fact squander their inheritance and then they were eventually um uh, overthrown uh they were eventually uh, because again the their uh in inability to exact justice and right ruling and to build a, a nation that would thrive uh they failed to do that and we're going to see that again later on as we continue to uh, delve into the uh, the words of our covenant but nonetheless uh, we see that also with midian midian is conquered by gideon we just again we see all the conflict and the war that's that take place but it's because again their their foolishness so he also it says that that they shall it shall be inherit the inheritance shall be a possession so the word for possession here is ahuza it means something seized and it's interesting because when um isaac took rebecca it says that he seized her <laughs> he took her she was seized all right, hold on. Having some trouble here. Let me go back. Don't know why. Okay, here we go. And it's interesting too because I was like, again, he took a wife, and so like a lot of people will say, oh, well, just intercourse is the really the the mark of of uh, marriage. No, that's not the case. That's fornication. Um. Uh. It says here. Then again, Abraham took. He took a wife. He took a woman. It's the word lacham. Look what it means. It means to capture, to seize. <laughs> uh, he took. He took one for himself. He captured her. He reserved her. He seized her. And it's the same thing with um, um, uh, 
Isaac, I'm sorry, with Isaac, uh, when she was finally brought to him, he says he seized her, he took her into his tent and was comforted by her. I thought that was beautiful. And again, you're not looking at this caveman kind of, you know, you know what you're looking at is like a, a choice that is made in, in your custody, under your hand, under your care, you become a uh, uh, an endowment, a gift, a possession. So beautiful. A woman is a gift. All right, so possession, something seized, a wife is seized, uh, especially land by occupying. Remember, we talked about this. How do you seize the land? You can't just physically go and grab your, grab your hand and seize the land. Like, that's not what he's talking about. We find by definition that the concept of seizing the land required occupancy. And we saw that earlier with the heritage, children being a heritage blessing. It means that they will occupy your estate. They will fill your house. They will fill the estate. They will occupy, seize, lay hold of. And if there are foreign people there, they will dispossess those people. They will have the legal right as your heir, or the sole heir, to dispossess any foreigners or invaders or trespassers or uh, people who are squatting, uh, whatever the case may be. But that's the idea is that they will occupy. And one of the blessings that's given later on in scripture is that uh, that your tents would be stretched. Uh, what does that mean? Again, it means that your that the people, the people, your your household will develop and grow, and that requires sustenance, provision, and all of these things that he promises. So uh, he says here it's a possession. Um, something sees especially land by occupying it requiring a delineated designation so here there um thus abraham sent the sons of keturah away even as ishmael was sent away and again it's not because he's rejecting them or denying them but he's delegating i mean uh delineate delineating he's sending them to a region so that they can be the head of their own house now and giving them provision to like a startup uh, business you know he's giving them uh, the means to start up whatever their future all right so remember that the land was part of that heritage blessing. It was a gift that was passed on, given to Abraham's seed, and then it would eventually be passed on as the occupants of each generation were supposed to dwell in the land. They were supposed to continue to thrive. The continuity of, uh, of life in Israel was supposed to be from generation to generation, which again points to being regenerative. The land is regenerative, when you allow it to rest and you follow the bylaws of Yah, the jubilees and the resting, when you tend to the land appropriately, it's regenerative. It can regenerate and regenerate and regenerate. And that really, again, signifies the hope of resurrection, the eternal life that we are putting our hope in. That points to that. If the earth can, can if the sun regenerates every morning, and you get a sort of shadow of that eternal life, every night you go to sleep and you open your eyes, if you're, if you're blessed to do so, Again, that is Yah saying, look, I assure you, <laughs> eternal life is a real thing. It's a real thing. Why squander your opportunity? Life is short, reconsider. Um, but we think about the land regenerating. After Why would the land regenerate? All the elements, they regenerate, right? Think about that because it is in that the creator is regenerative. And he created us in his image and in his likeness. So that means that it's in us to also be regenerated. We just need the spark. And that's what the Ruach is. The Ruach has been given back to us to spark, to initiate the hope of eternal salva or salvation, the hope of life. And so going back, remember the land was part of the heritage. It's a gift passed on from generation to generation. Uh, assuring that there is that, like I mentioned earlier, that reciprocal and servile relationship between man and the land, also known as harmony. So when two things work together, and I'm not talking about without conflict, because there's going to be conflict at times, you know, there's tension. Um, and even when there's growth, there's tension, which we will see in these chapters. When there's growth, there's tension. But the idea is that Yah has given to us his Ruach so that we know how, with wisdom, to work through the conflict. So that the, con the end result of the conflict is not, is not tyranny, it is not violence, it's not bloodshed, it's not brute force. 
but that the end result of conflict is peace and mediation. It's peace. It's um, learning to compromise and to work together again harmoniously. <laughs> and so that is a beautiful concept as well in regard to um, the, the land grant. So Yah created man to serve the earth and the earth to serve the man. Okay, and the Sabbath uh, for both, for the land and the man. Again, Sabbath given to the earth, Sabbath given to the man. A reciprocal relationship. Um, so again, we're talking about uh, this possession. So Yahuwah sends out the sons of Keturah. He gives them gifts. He gives them their inheritance. And he says, do with it as you will. In Genesis 17, 18, um, it says that Yahuwah, remember back then, looking at the heritage, Yahuwah promised to Abraham a gift or promises to gift Abraham's seed with an everlasting possession, pointing to the gift of eternal life. Again, pointing to regeneration. Now, I already mentioned earlier that everlasting means perpetual. And you look it up 5769 from generation to generation. So it's perpetuity from generation to generation to generation to generation. Mm -hmm to regenerate, okay, to read seed to seed to seed to seed, you take an apple seed, you eat it, you consume it, you put it back in the ground, you get an apple, you consume it, you see how this can work, right? That is really the picture of eternal life is that it will regenerate, that you put it back in, it comes back out and put it back in, it comes back out. Unless, of course, it's genetically modified. And uh, that would be, you know, Monsanto. So now, um, we'll talk about them being sent away, and I really want to, I want to sort of iron out these issues that would otherwise make it seem as though Abraham was being unjust or cruel, or that Yahuwah was being biased, or that he was showing nepotism, which is not the case. It says he's not, the, he does not favor man. Okay, so it's not what's happening here, but he again is securing because in that seed or in that designated individual will eventually come eternal life. So he is part of the preservation. He's preserving the promise. So it, he's protecting it. He's wouldn't you? <laughs> Y'all protect your cars. You protect things that are of value to you that you had to work hard for. How much more something that is going to uh, become a end all solution for everyone? Like, of course, he's going to protect it. And, and he knows the heart, right? So legally speaking, this is before the Torah of Moses was given. Of course, the Shoftims and the right ruling already existed in man because they were created in his image and likeness. They still had um, a, a shadow a recollection of what it was to do right. Um, so they had it in them. They were created in that fashion. Uh, but as they continue to give over to their flesh, they become more foolish and foolish and foolish. And as they become more foolish, they become more degraded in their ability to, to understand the difference between good and evil, right and wrong. They can no longer judge for themselves. Um, they are uh, uh, no longer able to um, think critically, right? Um, so back at that at that time there were still laws of the land the hittite laws the Husi laws the um the um, babylonian law systems you know hammurabi all the different laws that existed the hittites they all were governed that's what a nation was governed by their own laws so there were the laws of the land um so back then an heir legally could be sent away even as Abraham sent Ishmael away, and even again as the sons of Keturah were sent away. I'll give you an example. In, and this is actually Torah. So in Judges 11, 1, uh, we have a Gileadite. His name is Jephthath. Uh, he was the son of a harlot. There it's used as Isha Zana. Interesting to note, Isha Zana means born of fornication, not one that was born of promise or of covenant. And so that was interesting how I mentioned earlier to get a wife is not just simply by having you know intercourse with the individual or knowing them um, becoming familiar with a person um, but it requires that there be a, uh, a seizing or a taking by the hand and the concept or the Id uh, idiom was that uh, you would the hand you would become a covering or possession of mine you are taking and making that person legitimate as a wife so it required certain acts and symbolisms but in this case it was simply a zana remember katora was a isha 
Isha, a wife. Here, Isha, you see Isha, Nashim, Isha Nashim, Lacha, she was taken as an Isha Nashim. But here, the woman of fornication is Isha Dana. And again, it's not of promise or of a covenant. So, um, verse two, it says, the sons of Gilead's wife. So Gilead had a wife and he also went out and fornicated and he had a son, okay? And the sons of, of the Gilead's wife grew up and rose up against Jephthah. So he must have been the firstborn. So they rose up against him and they expelled him. They kicked him out saying to him, you shall not inherit in our father's house for you are the son of a strange woman. Interesting. I'll say really quick, in the book of Proverbs, various times, it talks about this strange woman or a harlot that works against wisdom, who is also metaphorically spoken of as a woman. Um, and this strange woman is the one that stands and entices you or lures you away um, by the weakness of your flesh. And he's talking here again, the same concept, but in the natural. So he says that you, they, they say to him, you were born of a strange woman. So the word here for strange is the word aher. And it means, look at this, of another heart that is to do the will of, of someone else, have a different will. Also of language or tongue, something not known or the unknown. And so remember that wives were legitimized by acknowledging them. Children or sons were also legitimized. Remember my son, remember Yahuwah said to Abraham, take Isaac, your son. We will also see this, this term used throughout scripture as Yahuwah says, Abraham's son, Sarah's son, you know, Hagar's son, again, legitimizing or saying that this is from this source, okay, uh, patrimony. And so uh, here, this is of a different, unknown, not known, not legitimate. So they're basically saying you are not a legitimate son. You cannot legitimately um, uh, possess our father's inheritance. So for that reason, they send him off. Um, and we know that if this, it's because being a, of a foreign, not without a covenant, you're not in agreement that you have a different heart. Your heart is, is, is deviant. It is very, very, I thought it was like a really cool example of, again, what it means to commit adultery or idolatry, right? To cause your heart to stray, to fornicate with other gods or to go astray um, by fornicating from your covenant relationship or your companion. Well, this is a perfect example of going astray and not creating a covenant or a commitment of promise. Um, it means to know somebody, but it's not a legitimate knowledge. It's not something that's legitimized. It's not something that's acknowledged by Yahweh. So whatever is produced from that union is illegitimate. Man, I thought it like, wow. So all the things that like sin and all the things that we bore on death is illegitimate. It's not a son. You know, it, death and sin and all the byproduct of sin is all illegitimate uh, and not acknowledged by Yahuwah. And so we know how powerful it is that out of the mouth, the heart speaks, right? All right, so just to, just to sum up that little story there, we see that uh, eventually Jephthah negotiates his return home. He agrees to fight the children of Ammon. It's a cool story. Uh, he also secures his status. And again, we're going to see that all throughout the words of script uh, of our covenant because that's really what it's all about. So um, he secures his status, okay? He negotiates his return. He secures his status as head. He tells them, make me a head again. Put me back in the position of a Roche, um, one above my brethren, and make me the captain. And so they said, yes, okay, we will. So they do. They make an oath, and he he's his status is restored. Regardless of all of that, he conquers the Ammonites. Um, and regardless, Jephthah, or Jephthah still, he... He, even though he receives his inheritance, he receives it in vain uh, because he ends up making an oath or a vow that whatever, you know, his daughter, remember that whole situation, um, that he offers her up under the oath unto Yahuwah. And it's then we don't know exactly what was going on there. I know she was an Ola or a burnt offering. But we, uh, it says that she remained a virgin or she remained airless. So that goes back to what I was saying earlier about, you know, we can perhaps maybe not be barren physically. We have children, but we see that their their works, their lives are barrenless. They're they're not fruitful in, in life. They're not 
they're producing as fools, right? They're taking their inheritance and they're squandering it. And so we see that this is the case. So regardless, Yah does not acknowledge. Unfortunately, um, Jeph Jephthah is not acknowledged because she he was born of fornication. So it's the same. I want you to really see this as unfortunate, but true. Those who are in their sin, they are not acknowledged as sons. You have to repent. You have to come in and be adopted. You have to be there has to be an acknowledgement a profession my son this is why it says that the ruach when we enter in um to the covenant it's the ruach who testifies that we are sons we're no longer alienated we're no longer foreigners we actually come into the house of elohim and he acknowledges us this is why yahushua says whoever denies me i shall deny them but those who confess me, I shall confess them. That's, that's part of that legitimacy. Okay. So if we truly are sons, then we're going to bear fruit. We're going to be part of this heritage legacy. We're going to produce the fruits of righteousness. We are going to have uh, eternity in our mind. We're going to have it in our heart. We're going to have the hope of the eternal life that is promised as part of that um, compensatory nature of our Elohim. It's, it's, it's an expectation. It's an and it's and it's not a vulgar one. It's not a a haughty or biased, a uh, proud one. It's one that rightfully so he wants us to have. His ruach has been imparted so that we would have the hope of eternal life. Again, testifying of his nature and who we are to him, his possession. Right, we're in his hand. That's why he says nothing can take us out of his hand. So I just want to give you an example of, yes, you, you could for whatever reason, but we do know that he says Keturah's son. In fact, in the verses here, um, it says the sons, uh, um, and, 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 and she bore him Zimron and so forth. And then it says, um, but unto the sons of the concubines, which Abraham had, Abraham gave gifts and sent them away from Isaac, his son. Okay, again, to secure so now interesting let's move down to verse 20. lots of good stuff here i'm sure you guys can find a lot of good things but i'm focused primarily on one thing here and we're talking about the birthright and the blessing so let's get down to verse 20. so in verse 20 it says and isaac was 40 years old when he took rebecca to wife the daughter of bethuel the syrian of padanaram the sister of laban the syrian so what we're going to see uh here is the certified birth record of esau and jacob so that's what's going on right here in verse 19 um it's a birth certificate it's again a document documenting uh the right of succession okay so what's happening here all right give me a second So what's happening here in this word? Can you guys see that chapter verse there? So uh, we see first a birth record, right? A certified birth record of Esau and Jacob. And again, part of that heritage blessing from sea to sea, generation to generation. And again, it's not that we're, Yah's depriving any seed of Abraham from anything. He gives to them in the natural, but the promise is only given to a designated seed. So again, you have to remember that there is a promise. And it's again, because he designates it from, um, precept uh, from line to line okay so this it says here it starts off by saying and these are the generations okay these are the generations um this is the generation of isaac and then he notice it says abraham's son legitimizing him okay abraham beget isaac now what's interesting is that the word here for generations we'll look at that it's the word tolda you see it there, tolda. And it's beautiful because we see to bear children, a boy, a girl, youth, generations. But guess what? So in Genesis, the word Genesis in Hebrew, that's a Greek word, Genesis. But in the Hebrew, Genesis is 
Tolda, it means the genealogy. So when you think about the book of Genesis, it's the book of Tolda, or Bereshit, meaning in the beginning of time. It, this is the generation of creation. It shows the descendants of something, that what descended from the source. And it says that Elohim, Yahweh, is the source of the descendants. All of creation are the descendants or the proceedings or the, uh, the results of his word, his spoken word. Um, Yahuwah Amar, right? So we see how beautiful that is again that this word tolda is tied in here as the generations also as in Genesis. So it says here generations tolda meaning genealogy, uh, a record of descent or progeny what we get the word progenitor okay used to denote the chronological procession of history as it was shaped by successive generations in one family oh i'm sorry uh, i'm reading over here uh i don't know if you guys can see it there yes there it is um shaped it refers to the successive generations in one family okay or in a broader vi uh, broader division by lineage um so in Abraham's case, even though we're seeing a record here, in Abraham's case, uh, we have legitimacy, okay, of his legacy or of his lineage being established first by faith. So the, his, the, who's the legitimate heir in this case? It's not always the firstborn, but the legitimate heir of the promise is the one who is established by faith then the physical through a natural heir so we're going to constantly see that there is the the flesh wars against spirit right we're going to see the natural is born of the natural and then that which is born of faith for the eternal promise must be inherited by faith and not flesh and blood let's read really quick what first corinthians 15 50 says because again this is about a promise that is given by faith that must be born of faith and therefore concluded by faith established perfected by faith therefore the true heirs of salvation you and i uh, receive that gift just like abraham by faith okay so let's read really quick what um first corinthians says wow i was way off so you can see over here in my notes i'm sorry i can't get this thing to move over i'm trying oh, hang on um okay here we go it's right here i don't know if you guys can I'm sorry about that trying this technology maybe if i I'm trying to get it to move over move over over okay let's try oh look at that. just be aggressive <laughs> first corinthians 15 50 says now i declare to you family mishpoka brothers and sisters i declare to you that flesh and blood the natural seed cannot inherit. What's this inheritance? Eternal life, like into the possession, land. You seize it. You're going to seize. You're going to lay hold. You're going to lay hold. You're going to take it in. You're going to possess it. Salvation, right? You take hold of it. So he's saying you cannot receive the kingdom of Yahuwah by flesh and blood cannot seize it nor does the perishable inherit the imperishable so even though we see that a promise is given to the natural seed which will eventually become a national people or nation israel a physical seed what we're looking at is something that's happening beneath the surface something that's hidden from the natural eye which is ultimately bringing forth the spiritual, which is truly the tangible and the real because it's not perishable. It is not corruptible. The spiritual is what really where we want to enter and that's the place our blessings, our rewards are stored up. We're looking forward to obtaining those rewards, the compensa uh, compensation for our suffering, right? We, we look forward to that uh, because again, in the spiritual realm or in the 
supernatural realm, the realm in which Yahuwah dwells. In that place, there is no corruption, there is no death, there is no decay. Uh, so again, we see that linear, that juxtaposing with the natural, moving alongside what's happening in the natural. So even though Isaac is a natural heir, but he's the heir of something spiritual by faith, the promise. All right, so moving on again, this is the birth certificate. And you have to forgive me because it is hot. It is like, oh, I don't know, like 100 degrees in here. And I'm like, ah, okay, so hot, okay. So uh, moving on, the birth certificate, right? So we're looking at the birth certificate here. So um, we have two nations. Uh, so we're moving on. Uh, verse 23. So just to, to clarify, she gets pregnant. She's barren and uh, her husband prays for her. Her womb is open. Yahuwah uh, puts seed in her womb. There's two seeds. And Yahuwah prophesied. She inquires of Yahuwah and says, why am I struggling here? And Yahuwah says that there are two. We're going to break it down. Um, verse 23, we're looking over here to the left. It says right here that there are two nations or two manner of people and that these two manners shall be separated from your bowels. And one people shall be stronger than the other people. And the elder shall serve the younger. And so um, this word, we're going to look at a few words. We're going to define a few words here, okay? So the first one is separated, okay? Let's look at this word for separated. So the word for separated is parad, and it means to break through, to divide, or to break the matrix. Um, but it also speaks of something that is divided and incapable of mixing, separated to the division, that there's going to be a division in these two nations. Ultimately, it speaks of uh, what is separated that cannot be brought together. They, they like the wheat and the tares. Think about the wheat and the tares, right? Um, be scattered to split into two or more parts or pieces. Um, it has a sense of being separated from, not a part of, or not mixing with. Okay. So he's saying that there's two that, that are not complementary. They're not the same. Okay, there's two nations, they're not the same. They are separated. So think of the dividing of the wheat. Think of the dividing of the wolves from the, the lambs, right? The tares from the wheat. The two nations shall be scattered, basically. He's saying they're going to be divided against each other and they shall not mix. It says, he says, Yahuwah says to her that they are going to come out of your bowels, which is interesting. I only brought that up because... The word here for bowels is me, and me is the same word that Yahuwah says that uh, his uh, Isaac will come from. He says Isaac will come from your me, from your bowels. Uh, so this is basically speaking of the womb or the organs of procreation, the inward parts. Abraham had that too, regenerative. Okay. So, and what's interesting, part of the prophecy, which we will see, um, uh, again, it's interesting because Abraham, the, um, um, Isaac does not know, uh, later on what happened with, oh, we don't know that. We're assuming that he doesn't know what went down with Jacob and Esau and him selling his birthright. But we know that, um, when Isaac is blessing Jacob, he doesn't know that that's Jacob. He thinks it's Esau and he does in fact put this in this prophecy comes to pass so even though it may seem as though jacob supplanted or deceived his way into receiving the birthright it's more like he was being cunning and had to because the flesh is cunning um but it was already prophesied it was already prophesied because it says here that uh, of the two nations one will be stronger more courageous in battle and as a result the lesser one the younger one the older one the elder shall serve the younger so the word for serve here is obed and obed means to be enslaved as a ma so to be enslaved by a master so that means that jacob the younger will be the master or the head over the other thus subjugating him uh, made me think of the crushing of the head and the bruising of the heel right where it says that uh, that uh, the seed of the woman will crush the serpent's head, the seed of his head, the head of his seed, and that his seed will bruise the woman's seed's heel. Military terms, right? Okay, moving down to verse 33. So what's happening here is basically a prophecy is given 
to um to rebecca uh, of these two the twins that are esau and jacob that are in her bowels that are in her womb and they are prophesied uh to have conflict that they will be at conflict or at war with one another um then uh we see a, so it goes on that rebecca loved jacob esau uh, Abraham, uh, Isaac loved Esau. And so there was this sort of nepotism or favoritism taking place. So then it says that Esau basically sells his birthright. That's what's going to happen next, okay? So in um, verse 33, let's go here to verse 33. It says that um, Jacob, uh, Esau comes in and he's famished and he desires some of the food that Jacob is eating. And basically, Jacob makes a barter with him. And it says here that Esau sells his birthright by oath. All right. And we're not going to talk too much about um, uh, imprecatory oaths, but that's basically what's happening right here. So it says that he sells. And the word for sell is the word makar. Makar means to trade as merchandise but to trade what to become indebted that is to surrender something so he makes merchandise of his right to acquire that's what the birthright is i'll give you definitions in just a minute so he basically makes merchandise of his right to acquire his father's strength and virility and instead became indebted or subjugated to his brother he basically sold out <laughs> and if you know anything about um self-imprecation or imprecatory oaths it basically invokes personal judgment calamity or a curse upon yourself when you make these oaths for example when jezebel says about elijah if i do not do to him what he has done to my my priests by tomorrow at the same time, may the gods do to me what he has done to the priest. So that's a self-imprecating oath. She had imprecated herself in the oath as the judgment would fall upon her. And so it's the same thing as it was prophesied, Esau without knowing, and again, just the turn of events, that Esau does in fact sell out and as a result puts upon him that imprecating oath. He puts upon him the judgment to release or to become a Obed or a slave or a servant to his brother. That's really what's happening here. He asks him to swear to him, and that's the word Shabbat, uh, where we get the word Shabbat or Sabbath, meaning seven or perfecting. He says, make it complete, seal it, right? A seal. He says, seal it with an oath, swear it, seal it. So he does. Um, we see a contrast here, really quick, speaking of Jezebel, of Naboth in uh, 1 Kings 21, 15 through 16, where Naboth, when Ab um, Ahab does uh, go and pursue him for his land, uh, he asks him to sell his heritage or his land to him, and he refuses to do so, saying, I will not give to you what is a heritage from my father's. So um, again, a contrast, right, of, of righteousness and then the error that Esau displayed here. So this is, again, the nature of his heart he was as a foreigner, right? Somebody who was not, didn't have the same heart or desire as his father did to carry on the spiritual legacy. Now, I'm going to get into some definitions here specifically birthright okay so we can understand what is actually happening what is a birthright so the birthright believe it or not is only mentioned a few times it is synonymous with firstborn but let me better break it down so birthright is strong's number 1062 it is the hebrew word bakor and it is established, the birthright is established by a right or ruling. It's, it's a, a, a right of passage. It's a right. And it is a uh, ruling. Shoftim, give me a second because I cannot get this to do what I want it to. 
All right. So the word birthright is bakor, and it means, um, or it's a right by ruling, okay? And it's given, to, usually this birthright is given to the firstborn, the primo genitor. Also, bakor is known as first fruits of the womb. And again, going back to what we first talked about, the heritage, the reward of the womb, the one that breaks the matrix, the one that is the uh the uh, symbol or the emblem of the union between two individuals signifying strength and virility, the posterity of the man and the woman and uh, all future and the hope and everything rests on, yay, <laughs> uh, we shall live and not die, right? And so all of that rests on this firstborn. Now this right by ruling, it's a rule, this right is usually assigned to, according to definition for the word bakor, is assigned to that which bursts the womb, also known as the matrix. Now, it's a symbol. The firstborn is a symbol and proof of the strength and virility of his parents. Again, going back to that heritage promise, or part of the covenant of the heritage, which is to be fruitful and to multiply. Apply. Now the root word is 1061, Bikur, and this is where we get the word Bikurim, or first fruits, as in the feast of first fruits. Uh, it speaks of a harvest, specifically grain or any kind of harvest, and the first fruits were the choice fruits that were, you, you know, given offer up to Yahuwah as a tribute. Uh, as Again, what are you tributing, offering to him as a tribute? The tribute was to acknowledge the continuity of of the continuation of his strength and his virility to produce, to do what it, the seed does, to provide fodder, to provide the seed, to make the sun, to make the rain, to bring forth the elements in order to produce what man cannot. So see, part of that offering, those harvest offerings were tributary. This is why with Cain and Abel, those were not burnt offerings, but they were tithes or tributary in which they were supposed to bring their bakor. Abel brought his bakor. He brought his first fruits, but Cain of his, the work of his hands, um, which was a a as a shepherd, he brought the best of his sheep, but his brother did not as a herd, as, as not a herdsman, as a, um, farmer he did not bring the best of his produce he did not bring a tribute offering he just brought whatever um but he did not acknowledge remember it's acknowledging the continuity he did not acknowledge yahweh as the source of his strength virility or continuity again we see that resistance or that rebellion the flesh from the beginning striving against the spiritual that which is um finds a joy in submitting to and uh, the uh, safety and assurance that comes from knowing that something greater than you is tending to you. But the uh, Cain was like, you're not my God, right? So we, again, we see this throughout time that this is the case with those who resist or reject Yahuwah's uh, governance. governance. All right, so birthright, this is what he's giving up. He gave up his birthright, he sold his right um, as the firstborn to be the symbol and proof of strength and virility. This is why in the prophecy that's prophesied to Rebecca is that the younger one will be the symbol of strength and virility and that in him, he will become the master of the elder, that he will become the symbol of strength. You see, that's it's super simple. Um, he will become the tribute. Uh, he will be the one who the the promise is now moving through. So the concept of primogenitor, uh, primogenitor basically refers to the rights and privileges as well as a designated portion or land of a future blessing to which a person is entitled by birth you know, we hear that thrown around a lot you're you think you're entitled well guess what a primogenitor is in fact entitled by right of ruling to specific privileges and portions specifically land well that would make sense but it was never so that the individual would be um 
self-gratified. It was never for the fat of the, the, the person would become fat and engrossed, but rather so that the greater the, pe the, the demand, the more resources would be acquired. So if you had 100,000 people that you were taking care of, then Yahoo would make sure that you had enough resources to provide for them. Think about the loaves and the fishes, right? Um, we see there also the same concept that Yahuwah gives him provision, Yahusha, uh, being the firstborn uh, of, of all creation. So we see that um, he receives provision enough for the demand. But again, it was never so that the individual can become isolated in his wealth, but whatever wealth he attained was again, to maintain, uh, to, to provide for, to be a, a, an expression, an example of Yahuwah's continuity and strength and virility, okay? His ability to produce. It's always about a reflection of him. So again, progenitor, uh, the rights and privileges a or a designated portion of land or possession. Now, it was usually the heir, and in most cases, this heir was a son, but it could also be a female or a daughter, okay? We're not going to talk about that today, but the daughters of Zelophilad, I think Zelophilad, go read that. They receive their portion. They have their own land in which they can actually become head of their, or masters of their house. So they have a portion too. So the heir, in most cases, a son, would take on the estate. It doesn't mean that I get the mansion. It means I get the responsibilities, okay? He takes on the estate that is with all of its responsibilities. Now, in Abraham's case, this right of succession was to be passed on until the promise was fulfilled. So remember, we're going to see uh, in the natural, there's always this contest between the natural and the promised seed, the natural seed and the promised seed or the seed of promise. And so this seed will continue until the oath that Yahuwah made to Abraham is fulfilled or completed. This is what Yahusha was saying when he was on the stake and he says, it is finished. He completes the contract or the oath, he makes it complete. It's done. It's finished. It's over. It's not about the law. It had nothing to do with him doing away with the law. It had to do with the fact that he was, in this case, in right of succession, he was re the promise was being passed on from faith to faith, from faith to faith, until it reached Yahusha, and Yahusha then completed it by exhibiting obedience perfectly. Okay? He completed it all. He just perfectly, that's it. And as a result, the promise was made complete, which is why he can now offer salvation or deliverance or eternal life. Hallelujah. Because that's what it was from the beginning, the heritage blessing. It was to procure, to secure, or um, part of the, um, oh, the everlasting possession, right? But what is it called? Um, I don't know conservation <laughs> Conser conservation right to conserve all right so back to the birthright primogenitor again we're talking about specific rights but what was he giving up so he was basically saying i want to be blessed and i want to be a leader but i don't want to do yah's will i don't want to i don't want to do my i don't want to continue my father's will which is again abraham isaac Isaac was doing the will of his father. Abraham, Abraham was doing the will of Yahuwah. So we see that progression. Isaac was willing. Esau was not. Jacob was willing. So this is why Yahuwah dis, dis, inv, dis, uh, disinherits him. I'm going to show you something. I'm going to prove it to you, okay? So remember, an heir, even just because you're the firstborn, we're going to see throughout time, that you could actually refuse the, because it's responsibility, it's a responsibility. You could refuse, just like Yahusha came of his own volition, he could have refused the responsibility. It was a great call. He could have refused it. You could also sell out, as we see with Esau, or you could forfeit this right by committing an egregious sin, okay, like Reuben or Levi or Simeon. Um, the responsibility was great. And so therefore, I, and you had to choose it of your own volition, which again, we see that Jacob by action does, even fights for it. Forget about by volition, he fights for it. So the birthright is basically 
a status, okay? The person was usually elevated. That means that the person's status was elevated as free among free. I'm gonna just explain that right now. He basically had the right to rule. He had one, he was one above, one above the others as the head in which all others were subject. So we're looking at master and slave here. So if all of Israel were free, and this right, the birthright, was given to an individual, that individual would be elevated above all of them. I mean, we're going to talk about the divine right to rule in just a minute, because that's what's really happening here. It's setting it up for the divine right to rule, okay, the succession of kings. So that individual would rise up. We see that with Judah, as the scepter is placed in Judah's hand. But the birthright is given to Joseph. We're not there yet, but we're going to see that. So Judah is rising up. So that means that all the other brothers... Judah has the final say. Judah is the head of heads. He's a chief of chiefs, <laughs> right? But we see even with Yahushua, he rises up above all his brothers and he's the king of kings and the El of El. He's all the kings above the things, right? He's one above. He's above. He's above the angels. He's above mankind. He's above. He's above. So we see status here. So the birthright gives a status to the individual as a master of masters. So even though Esau and Jacob were twins and Jacob would have been a free man under the hegemony of his father or the inherited rights of his father, he had great possessions. If Jacob, this had not happened and Esau received his, his birthright, he would have been a master over uh, um, the echelon. Jacob would have always had to submit to him in ruling. But we see that Esau was not qualified for the promise because he rejected his mother and his father's commands and he dishonored them. He did not obey them. Obey your mother and your father and all shall be well with him. He did not honor them. He married Hittite women, even though they told him that he should not. And at the end of the 27, Genesis 27, his, his own mother says, I'm vexed and grieved by this boy. Right? She brought uh, heaviness to her because of his, his uh, marriages, his unions with foreigners. So he would have never been able to remember a foreigner is not qualified. All these fornication and the things that he was doing, these, these would have been illegitimate heirs. So Esau was not qualified. Also, he made merchandise of his, of his, uh, of his position. So he thought he could sell himself. He sold out. It, just like people today, they sell themselves out for numbers and for likes and for subscription and for money and for all sorts of things that are really as as equal in value to a bowl of stew so it, it, again the sellout he was a sell he didn't have uh the heart he was like that foreign that stranger and that's what the prophecy was is that one would be divided against the other they would not be the same and they would not mix so remember um an heir even just because you're the firstborn you could still sell out you could forfeit and you could also lose the right uh because of sin it had to be an egregious uh, egregious sin not just a random you know small error uh now birthright is a status again that places you one above um we see that judah received that rule um it means that judah would be one above internally but joseph received that one above right above all his brothers as the status promise was given to his sons now remember joseph also had that dream that his sheaves rose up above his other his brother's sheaves and the sheaves bowed down to him so again pointing to this birthright status which again as we continue to develop we will begin to understand through the illustrations or through the testimonies that are given we're going to see these things more often now, uh, Jacob, you know, we know with Jacob and Joseph, uh, he does adopt uh, his sons um, in his name, but we'll talk about that another time. Okay, moving on to 26, a seed according to its kind. So um, I know you can't see my notes here, and that's the birthright and the blessing. Let me see if I can't share. All right, so uh, let's do this. Can you guys see my notes now? I fixed it. There we go. So 26.1, it says here, and there was a famine in the land. Interesting. Famine and barrenness were very common. I'm just going to read through. So basically what's happening is Isaac is now being directed. So Isaac, uh, Jacob receives 
Esau's bless, uh, birthright. He receives that status. He's going to become elevated above his brother. He's going to become a master, the head. He's going to take on the rights and responsibilities of the spiritual promise, not the physical promise, because we don't see that Jacob doesn't really receive those physical promises. He doesn't, um, he doesn't inherit the land of Canaan. His sons do. Hold on. He doesn't inherit. His sons do. But Jacob doesn't really receive these promises in the natural, but in the spiritual, he does. He does. So Isaac is directed by Yahuwah. That's happening here. God's promise to Isaac. Um, he's directed by Yahuwah as his father was during a time of famine. So it's sort of, uh, we see this, the pattern is the same. The pattern, right? The stylistic markers are the same, uh, which again points to the continuity of the author or Yahuwah being the sole proprietor. So Isaac's directed through the famine like his father was and he's told not to go into egypt because if he had gone into egypt because remember this is very important again the pattern the children of israel go into egypt during a famine and when we get to the part of slavery we will uh may it make sense when you understand how you can actually be put in bondage which i would love to go over right now but we don't have the time if i had my notes really quick boom maybe just, well we don't have time anyways but you could actually subjugate yourself during a time of famine it's okay we'll go over it another time um during a time of famine which again was supposed to be a temporary subjugation or a temporary uh covenant in which you subjugated yourself to another mm -hmm. and again it was for posterity or to maintain your livelihood um you're really giving yourself over to the mercy of that uh, entity and so uh this was very common um as they would roam around people who would migrate it was part of the migrate co migration covenant um as abraham migrated he also would go from barren lands to fruitful land in which Yahuwah would provide resources of wells and water and that water was symbolic again Yahuwah was showing him where to dig these wells was showing him that he would provide for him beautiful 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 concept of liveliness and his provision for us which is why we need not be concerned with what we will eat and what we will drink it's really again the basis of life she the fun there should be a fundamental expectation that you if 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 wicked rulers know how to give good gifts to their son how much more a good ruler <laughs> children if you ask for a piece of bread is he going to give you a stone or if you ask for something is he going to give you a snake no he's a good good elohim that means he knows how to protect what is his to maintain what's in his possession and to make it multiply it's our mindsets it's our mindsets that cause our own defeat most of the time it's the way that we perceive things it has a lot our, our defeat and our victories have a lot to do with our perception that's why this is so important that we really see the simplicity and the legalities here because again what we're seeing is yah's graciousness we're seeing his nature his his virility his strength his power and all the things that he's capable of we're seeing that he is a capable elohim he's not a wooden idol he's not a stick he's not you know some concrete you know god that sits without ears and eyes and is incapable is uh you know um um uh, impotent right this is not him he's omnipotent but he's not impotent and so isaac he says don't go to egypt because again it's before his time right right place wrong time um because you you and your people you'll become a slave there and because it's bound to happen right but do not put yourself in egypt's hands that's going to be ham's lineage okay and verse three he says i will be with you so he gives him surety and why does this have to happen why do we see this reiteration is it because yah is like okay i'm gonna say it again and i'm gonna say it again and i'm gonna say it again because repetition is the purest form of uh, mem uh, memorization or learning no it's simply because again as abraham passed away he reiterates or reinstates remember in states is to put into position um or to inaugurate or to establish so he has to reinstate or instate the next person so that's why we see the 
same terms and the same vows being reiterated to the next generation. So here he again, he's telling him in verse three, I will be with you. He's reinstating uh, or he's instating with him. I will be with you and will bless you for unto you and unto your seed. I will give all this land and I will perform the oath which I swore unto your father Abraham. Again, now he's instating the next generation. He's going to do the same thing with Jacob uh, in verse 20, uh, chapter 28, which we'll get into next time. So again, he's instating that um, the previous relationship, just because the individual died, we see the regenerative properties now being uh, motile or moving through um, Isaac. Okay, so his word is motile. It's moving. It's alive. And so now he's reinstating or, or uh, uh, restating, if you will, instating what he reinstating what he established with Abraham now he's establishing it again with Isaac and then we're going to see the same thing with Jacob I think I said that already I think I just had a glitch that was a glitch <laughs> my brain just glitched now I don't want to speak anything negative over myself but I was going to cancel today because woof not doing not doing so well I went to my brother's house to go visit and they had some funky bug there and they were like oh and I went in anyways and I was like I'm good um should have left but i didn't and so now i'm like oh not i'm not gonna speak death over myself but i actually was like no i'm gonna push through and that anointing is god i'm as i'm heating up i'm so uncomfortable i'm 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 sweating which is a good thing um because i'm gonna break that thing i want my my body to heat up i want a temperature um, but thank you for being patient so that was a literal glitch like my brain just glitched right now. where am i <laughs> Where am I? Okay, verse four. <laughs> so he's basically saying to him, that was funny. He's basically saying to him that he will make your seed to multiply as the stars of heaven. And again, part of that heritage blessing, he says, um, you're to multiply your seed as the stars of heaven and will give unto your seed all this land and in your seed shall the nation of the earth be blessed because abraham obeyed my voice he said and kept my charge my commandments my status uh, my statutes and my laws um so very interesting we're going to kind of go through this really quick we're going to run through this so he again that's what's happening here nothing too uh, interesting uh he's just basically reinstating uh the covenant with him um let me go here all right so in verse 10 we move down to isaac and abimelech again it's sort of the same pattern uh but again why are we seeing this so again so this so this could kind of remove any of the uh confusion or complexities is surrounding why this is duplicated do you do row right why is there a, a reiteration here uh or a pattern emerging so believe it or not um the abimelech that's here oh my head the Abimelech that's here is the same Abimelech that, uh, or Abimelech that is um, in Abraham's time. It's the same guy. We know that because he brings out the same. Um, he comes out with his captain, and the captain is the same guy that came out with him when he dealt with Abraham. So it's the same captain, the same guys, the same people. Um, so what's interesting to note is again, why is he reiterating? Well, like I said earlier, the covenant or the oath, the contract of peace, we talked about this last time, that Abimelech makes with Abraham has concluded with the death of Abraham, you know, to death do us part. It has concluded. So Yah is actually showing how he reinstates that hegemony or that hedge of protection for isaac as he did for his father we're showing we're seeing the similarities we're seeing how it was a setup uh but not in a in a uh, cunning way but in a wise way so we see the pattern is basically the same you know uh he's out there he says you know uh she's my sister uh rebecca is my sister but she's really my wife and he's like oh they were out there sporting and abimelech's like why he calls Isaac over and says, why have you done this? You know, surely she's your wife. Um, and that's interesting because he, some of my friend, you know, friend of my uh, sister of mine said, you know, it's probably because he was old in age and wasn't desiring a woman. But you notice that he's like, one of my men 
almost slept with her. And the word, the, the, the Hebrew word there is like uh, almost, you know, almost had, might, it says here, might lightly have lean <laughs> with her. It means almost had sex with her. That's what it means. Um, with your wife. And then you would, and that would have brought guiltiness upon us. So he was pretty upset, right? He's like, man, it almost happened. So this is the same cause with uh, Sarah. This is why he, Abimelech had to go and pay the guilt price. And he was like, here, I paid for my, and I assure you that she's innocent. She didn't have, she didn't almost lean with me. <laughs> she didn't lean with me, nor did we sport together. And um, you can go ahead and open the matrix of my, my concubines and my wife. And thanks for everything. But uh, your wife is innocent. So we see the same thing that guilt from a, committing adultery because even in the Hittite laws, adultery was illegal. So as a result of the same situation, again, we see the same covenant now being established with Isaac. So Abimelech basically charges as a result of this threat. There was the threat of guilt again, just like before. And the fear of Yahuwah is still on him. He's still aware that Yahuwah was with Abraham, but he needs to know now, is he with Isaac? Do I have to provide the same uh, provision, the same um, safety measure? Do I have to provide for Isaac too? Is Yahuwah with Isaac? Well, it says that Abimelech then charges all of his people. Again, Yah assuring, securing Isaac and his people. He says, Abimelech charges all his people saying, he that touches this man or his wife shall surely be put to death. So we see again, the hedge of protection because meant that regenerative must be reestablished over Isaac, just like it was with Abraham. Okay. Because the previous one was, he was loose from obligation by death. So now uh, moving on in verse 15, it says the Philistines, Scenes, they were envious of Isaac for it says for all the wells which his father's servants had dug the Philistines had stopped them up with dirt so eventually Abimel Abimelech acknowledges the threat of Isaac's might his virility right and asks him to basically leave for fear he says of an uprising for fear that uh you know he would become great and rise up later on he says that you, they would cause harm so he's afraid he sees by numbers he's afraid by numbers so it says that the, he goes out and he migrates to this place called Gur. where does he go gerar um oof I'm tired okay the herds, but but as he's there, he's trying to find some water because he needs water to feed his you know animals and his family. So there it says that the herdsmen of Gerar strove against Isaac as he was unearthing the wells of his father, uh, calling the first place as they strove with him. He called that place. Isaac, which means not Esau, but Isaac, meaning strife. And then again, he called another well Sitna, meaning opposition. And yet the final well, he called it Rehoboth. Now, right here, I want to stop right here for a second. So again, as I was reading, I was like, again, that's what the flesh does. <coughs> Excuse me. That's what the flesh does. It strives against the spirit. The flesh will constantly rise up in opposition to the rule and reign of righteousness, to the rule of the spirit, the ruach that Yahweh has given to us for right ruling. The flesh wants to be an Elohim, a God in its own right. The flesh wants to do as it will. It wants to pursue its own desires and uh, become hedonistic, but not recognizing that it has to subjugate itself to someone or something, eventually becoming a slave to its very appetite, its own appetite. Very dangerous thing to allow your weak flesh to rule. It's like allowing your five-year-old to take care of the bills and to pay the rent and to do all the things that a grown man would do. It's an incompetence, but that's what the flesh is. Flesh is not the enemy, by the way. Your flesh is not the enemy. The flesh strives is against the spirit but the flesh must be subdued and the best way to do that is to love your 
self love love conquers beloved love conquers love is how you subdue that's why the word says when love elohim and then love your neighbor as yourself you have to subdue when you truly have a love is is really the force that is governing and ruling in you you say no to the things that you know are not good they're harmful and you're able to discipline right but you have to have the ruach the ruach helps you because yahuwah is love so when love is truly working in you you're able to resist the tantrums and the wantonness and the demand of the flesh for the things that are not good um you begin to take care of your temple you take care of yourself uh you know how to monitor and govern and rule self-control right all of these things so the flesh is not the enemy but what happens is when we allow our flesh to rule because we've quenched the spirit because we uh you know silenced the spirit we're like shut i don't want to hear you i don't want wisdom right and we allow our flesh to rule the enemy comes in and continues to tempt us and tempt us until we are indebted until we become so in debt because the penalty for sin is death the payment we cannot pay back so we be, we put ourselves in slave we become slaves we are indebted to sin and then sin gives way to the house of death we end up becoming this uh slaves of, of death death is our master and rules over us and then at the end it takes possession right um again i can't i really can't wait to get into the whole slavery aspect but there is something um called it's called distraint. And so distraint is basically um, to seize upon something for payment. So it's when you are um, neglecting or unable to pay, then the master or the lender can be strained. And sometimes that included you if you offered yourself um, as uh, payment. So death is the master and death will then at the that's what death is at the time the pointed death will seize you death will distraint it said this is mine because uh it owes me a debt there's a debt right uh but that's why yahusha pays that debt okay so i can go on and on about all sorts of other things let me stay focused here so oh the blessing where are we he called that final place Rehoboth. And the reason why I brought these up was, again, the strife, uh, the uh, places, the wells, the strife, and then the opposition. And so, again, that's what it is. When we allow our flesh to rule or to govern, the flesh is weak. So the enemy really doesn't have any power against the soul of the man who is actually abiding in the spirit. None at all. Because the spirit does not desire the things of the flesh. It's not the word says the flesh is weak but the spirit is willing so the same the enemy can't really tempt no not really no, no no let me rephrase that the enemy has no power over the spirit the enemy does have influence over the flesh he can influence manipulate our flesh he's cunning he's like a snake so he can titillate and stimulate the flesh uh, but when we the end the flesh becomes the enemy when we give our flesh over to the rule of Satan, uh, that's when the flesh becomes an enemy. That's when we see ourselves, our family members or whatever, addicted uh, or cutting, you know, suicide, depressed, anxious, obese, like whatever it is, we, we see that they're oppressed. They are under a wicked or heavy master or ruler that is afflicting them. They're afflicted. Uh, diseased or whatever uh, but then we see somebody like us prospering right advancing and full of joy and peace even in the time of conflict even the weakness of our flesh we see joy and peace and endurance and uh, this desire to to get things right and to do things right it's a stark contrast so it says ultimately he called the final place both after he wrestles and strives and wrestles and strives and wrestles and strives he finally finds a place and it's there that he's able to settle and he reason why he calls that place Rehoboth is he says uh, the word Rehoboth uh, there it means a broad road or a vast place and so he says for now Yahuwah has made room for him so I brought that up because uh, again it really just reinforces that when we are growing we can never be free from conflict while we're in these earthly vessels so while we're in this, as workers, strangers in this 
land or in this place uh temporary dwellers while we're here we're going to find conflict there's going to be conflict there's going to be strife opposition um the best thing that you can do is again exercise self-control learn to govern your flesh so that your flesh is not overthrown constantly right and as a result you'll learn to walk in victory um also whenever we're dealing with conflict which is anticipated we should know that conflict usually comes so when you feel discouraged and you're being like oh man the enemy's hitting me it's usually the result of growth when the when you become when you're growing or stretching uh that there will be conflict or strife and then it's because again you're advancing and the enemy is not want that right he's going to try to oppose you but eventually yah will make room for that growth uh but basically what's happening is like you're pushing out your tents or your borders okay so stay the course and don't give up before time is is uh, before your appointed time okay moving on to 24 and yahuwah appeared unto him the same night and said again reinstating to him um to Isaac, reminding him there in that place, he says, um, I, I am the Elohim of Abraham, your father. Do not fear, for I am with you, and I will bless you, and I will multiply the seed, your seed, for my servant, servant Abraham's sake. Again, just reinstating. Um, it's interesting to note that uh, as right after that, so right after Yahuwah appears to him and he finds provision there, um, even amongst uh, these other men, it must have gotten back to Abimelech somehow because Abimelech, Abimelech eventually comes and he offers another covenant, a treaty of peace. It says in 26, Abimelech, Abimelech went down to uh, went to him from Gerar and uh, Ahuzath, one of his friends, and Pichol, the chief captain of the army. Um, and Isaac said, why, I thought you hated me. You sent me out. Um, and he was like, I'm sorry. Okay, I see that you are with you. So again, Abimelech needed to see that all that had to happen. All that had to happen. Because what happens? Abimelech then enters into a covenant of peace, just like he did with his father, Abraham. So all that needed to happen. So again, oftentimes when we're going through difficult situations, we do not see the, the end from the beginning. All we see is what is happening to us currently, and it's painful, and we get disparaged, and we start with our mouths, and we're like, oh my God, you know, and then just, we just misunderstand. We misinterpret what's happening. We cannot see the bigger picture. That's why it's important to stay focused. Stay focused as you endure. God knows your beginning from the end. He's the author of faith uh, and finisher of your faith, and he will bring you to a good place. He says that he came to give you a hope and a future. He has a plan to prosper you, not to harm you. We can have confidence. We see the pattern is the same. You're serving this Elohim, hopefully. You're serving this Elohim, this Elohim, the one that says, I will take care of you. I am bringing you to the end. I am the one that has set things in motion. So even though you might find yourself in difficult times or waiting or wanting or striving or being opposed or, you know, in your own weakness or you find yourself because of, because of foolishness, you handed your flesh over to uh, the, the lusts thereof and you find yourself, you know, in bondage, Yah knows when to deliver you. He knows when to break the yoke of bondage from off your neck. Uh, he knows when to stretch your territory. He knows when to mature you be still let your words be few trust that he's got you because it's it's all about him it's really truly all about him he he knows what he's doing even though we may not but that was part of the covenant of you entering in by faith okay all right let's get into 27 and then we're done and so 27 the blessing now this is probably uh my favorite part here um, because we're going to talk about some terms. So uh, let me just give you a rundown overview. Let me see right here. If I have the rundown. Okay, yes, I do. And then the double portion. And the right, divine right to rule, which is really good. You just want to stick around. We're really almost done. We have like one more page. Stop it. <laughs> okay, the law of interstate interstate succession yes there's such a thing the law of interstate succession so basically the law of interstate succession 
is the let me see here let me read it from here and i can just go ahead and take this down okay so the law of interstate succession is basically when a person dies without a will then the court would make a rule and distribute accordingly. And again, we see that with the daughters of Zelophehad in Numbers 27, verses 8 through 11. Now, if you want to understand the law, the law of interstate succession, uh, read Numbers 27, all of it, and then keep going to 30. Uh, again, it really defines all of the laws. It's succession. It's basically the law of succession. So one will succeed the other, the other the other so if uh, he has no sons it'll go to the daughters if he has no daughters it'll go to the nephew if he has no nephews it'll go to the cousin you see so it's succession okay success rights or the right of succession so in the case with zelofa had these daughters and this is beautiful 27, 8 through 11, these daughters recognize that as the land or as possession is being given, the land is being divvied up or portioned out to the tribes, they come forth and they say, hey, wait a second. Well, our father died. He was not part of the rebellion, but he did die in his sin. And therefore, uh, he has no sons and uh, we are all that is left. There's no will. There was nothing ascribed to us, right? And so they basically ask, this is what they say. This is their protest. Um, they said, why should the name, now this is important, why should the name of our father be removed or blotted out? They have wisdom. Why should the name of our father's house be blotted out? Why should our father's name be removed? Give us a possession among men, among our brothers. So remember the land, the land possession, acquiring land meant that you were a master, you were free, you were a ruler. We do see that later on that they do get married and they do contend and they were like, er, you know, uh, what happens if we, so they put it kind of like a, a stipulation to, to secure the land. So Moses, listen to this, Moses takes this concern <laughs> And brings it before Yahuwah. I'm going to break it down in a minute. Brings it before Yahuwah. And Yahuwah says, it is right. It is right. Right ruling. Give him a portion. Okay. So basically, the right of succession is an inheritance that is to pass on. Literally, the term cross over from one to the next in line, including daughters. So daughters, women, if there is no son or if the sons that precede her are wicked or corrupt or forfeit, right, their possession, their birthright, then a woman can actually possess land and she can be an heir and she can be a master of her own house. She can be a ruler. I know some of you men, you know, that have been programmed improperly don't know that, but you're going to have to contend with the concept to hear that Yahuwah is saying, it is right. Now, they didn't intend to stay single in that position position because it's a lot of responsibility to take on a household uh, without any provision, without any children, without any husband. Like, it's not something they would have wanted to maintain. It's very difficult. So they did eventually marry. It says that they married almost immediately, right? Uh, the idea, though, uh, was that um, they, they would maintain their father's name or the house that they would uh, act in in um, in lieu of their father. They would act in, in, in they would act in place of, of a man or their brother or son that was not given. Okay, so in, in Genesis chapter twenty seven, we see that Esau, uh, Abraham. Let me get there. It's so hot. <laughs> I'm sorry. I'm just like roasting. I'm pushing through. Okay, this is good stuff. Okay. Uh, Genesis 27 came to pass that when Isaac was old and his eyes were dim that he could not see. So Isaac is dying here and his eyes are real dim. He can't real see He's blind. Okay. And basically what's going to happen is that he is saying now it's time for me to um, bless my sons to give them their inheritance before I die. And so uh, he says, you know, uh, 
call call over my son go to he tells esau go get me some food go make me some savory meat that i love bring it to me so that my soul will may bless you before i die but rebecca's listening she hears this and so she speaks to jacob and says go 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 get me some venison and i'll cook it for your dad and then you're gonna go in you're gonna get the blessing now remember here he has the birthright he already has the birthright. Now he's going to get the blessing, okay? And I'll explain what all these are in just a second. So he's going to get the uh, the blessing. So he says, and bring it to him that he that he might eat, and I will I will make sure everything works out the way it's supposed to. And so, um, so Jacob basically uh, does what what his mother tells him. Um, but then he's concerned. He's like, well, what if he tries to reach out to me? And he's like, ah, I'm going to put hair on your arm. So we just see the elements of deception here. Uh, they're being cunning and they're trying to figure out how they can uh, pull this off. So Rebecca, she does what's necessary. Go read the chapter. She gives him the bread and the meat and she says, take it to your dad so that he can bless you. Now, in it starts off in Genesis 27, 18. And there's a reason why I brought up the daughters of Zelophehad, which we'll look at in a minute. It'll tie together. So in Genesis 27, 18, it says, and Jacob came unto his father and said, my father, here I am and he said who are you and he's he said my son and Jacob said yes I am I'm Esau your firstborn right in 27 19 he calls himself the Bakur right he says I'm your firstborn um, I have done according as you have told me uh, I then arise I pray and sit with me and eat and that your soul may bless me okay so he basically says, um, I'm your firstborn, so now you have to bless me with the provisions of a firstborn, and then you're going to also bless me. So there's a blessing that's tied in with the uh, inheritance, right? Not always, but in this case, yes. Watch this. So to bless in this case, he's asking him to bless him. So to bless in this case served as the will. This, remember, the law of interstate succession is when a person dies without a will, then that leaves the court. The court will have to make the decision. That's the case of, of Numbers 27, 8 in Zelophehad, the daughters. There was no, the, the father did not give the a portion of his inheritance away. So the court, Moses and the judges, they make the decision along with Yahuwah to give a portion out. They divvy out. And so, but in this case, he is leaving a will. We do see that there is a um, something being bequeathed. So in this case, uh, though he's blessing him orally, he's speaking out as a will to transfer over uh, his estate to his firstborn. Okay, so it's by by mouth he's going to transfer it over. This is basically modeled after Yahuwah's interaction with his people. As they become patriarchs, that's what patrimony means. They become fathers of the faith or the head or the chief of the faith, okay? So he basically is uh, interacting, yeah, interacts with his people the same way. This patriarchal concept will then become the foundation in which transmission, watch this, of physical, emotional, and spiritual vitality are passed on from generation to generation. Well, this makes sense. So if he is by, he's just speaking over him and he's transferring or passing it on, it's Jacob who believes, it's the person who receives these words because he, he has to flee. He goes and lives with Laban. It's not like he possesses any of his dad's property for many, 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 many years. So again, it's something that he receives by faith. This is how it's passed on. Always the promise. Yah gives Abraham a promise. Abraham didn't receive it yet. He didn't receive Isaac for many, 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 many years. <laughs> but he believed. And this is the same with salvation. Faith cometh by hearing the word. This is it. This is how we receive our inheritance. They hear my voice. And so there is, this is all part of that will. And even if there wasn't a will in place, Yahuwah will make a decision that you would receive your portion, that you would not be removed or blotted out, but that your name would be written in the Lamb's Book of Life. That's what the daughters of Zelophehad were protesting. Their right to a possession, that their name, the Father's name would not be blotted out.
So he's asking him to bless him, to transfer over his estate. By faith, he's receiving it. And so it is with all the patriarchs of faith that they too, Noah by faith, Abraham by faith, Isaac by faith, Jacob by faith, Joseph by faith, you by faith, Jessica by faith. We haven't received eternal life yet, but we believe. All right, Genesis chapter 27, verses 28 through 29. Um, therefore, uh, he blesses. He's going to bless him. So remember, it's about transmission. He's transmitting by faith your physical, emotional, and spiritual well-being, the vitality to be fruitful, to multiply, to go from generation to generation. Now, he gives a... Uh, Isaac gives Jacob the blessing, thinking he's Esau. He gives it to him, saying in 28 and 29, Yahuwah bless you of the dew of heaven and the fatness of the earth and plenty of corn and wine. Let people serve you and nations bow down to you. Watch this. Be a gabor, a master, one above, head above, right? The, the, the status of a master, free among free. Be that no, that no, no, you will bow down to none, but they will bow down to you. That's Yahusha. He's a gabor. He's a master above all. He bows down to none. Well, Yahuwah, right? Yahuwah, the father, the father, he submits to the father. But that's why the, the, when you, when Paul gives the, um, the echelon, the order of, of authority, he says, the father is the head of Yahusha. Yahusha is the head of man. Man is the head of woman. See? So he bows down to none. We're going to get into this for a second, right? The uh, divine right to rule. But he's basically saying that um, you will be a Gabor. You will be a master over your brothers. And he says, and let your mother's sons bow down to you. Cursed is everyone who curses you and blessed are those who bless you. And again, remember, he's receiving these words by faith. <laughs> So now we know that later on in Deuteronomy 33, 28, the land of Canaan, listen, this is beautiful. The land of Canaan, I know I'm animated over here with my hands. This way I stay cool. The land of Canaan is turned a land of grain and new wine. And so again, he's prophesying to the right person. <laughs> he's transmitting the promise to the right person. Because he's saying that that may, may you receive the dew of heaven. What does that mean? He said that that word dew is rain and the fatness of the earth. He's saying that may you receive your provision. He's talking about a harvest, your provision. May you be fruitful. May you multiply. That comes from the rain and the resources of the earth that only Yahuwah can provide. We can tax these. We, we can do it ourselves. We can cultivate these. We can't make the rain come even though man is trying. But I mean, ultimately, it's not within our means. We will mess things up, right? We, that's why everything's going to eventually be because man keeps trying to mess. They keep trying to be gods, right? And so he's saying, may you have provision. And he does even in Laban's land. He finds provision. We'll see that. But the most important thing here is he's like, you are going to be a Gabor. Nations will bow down to you. And you're going to master, you're going to be one above, a head above your brothers. Your mother's sons will bow down to you. Okay. And those who curse you will be cursed and those who bless you shall be blessed. So again, the land of Canaan is termed Deuteronomy 33, 28, grain and wine, which is what he promises. A land of fertility. It's very fruitful. It's very lively. And corn, it's not necessarily corn, it's grain. Okay, but the grain and the wine, by the way, are two of the three provisional blessings. The only one missing here is oil that comes later. But nonetheless, the these thing these these harvests represent or symbolize again the virility, the sufficiency, and the sustenance of something. So he says, May you be virile, may you be sufficient, and may you have sustenance. That is, may you become a harvest. May you produce. It's the right person. This is what he would have been giving to Esau. Now imagine Esau had a bunch of Hittite wives. He was he was rebellious and disobedient and a hunter. If he would have uh, he would have all these things <laughs> All these things would have been given to him for wickedness, for evil. He would have done wicked with them. He would have done evil with them. 
right? So we see Yah never fails, even though man may mess with things and sort of twist things up and, and try to, again, interrupt the procession. Um, but uh, it always fails. Yah never fails. Love never fails. Now, moving on to verse 34, it says, um, and when Esau heard the words of his father, because again, now after he gives him the blessing, Esau comes in and he's like, hey, I brought your food. And he's like, what? Who are you? He's like, I'm Esau. You're what? He's like, oh my goodness. Jacob came in and supplanted. He basically says um, that Jacob has defrauded you, my son. The word there for defrauded is Mirma, And it means that he has received your blessing through fraud. <laughs> he is, he did. I'm sorry. And so Esau's upset and he demands. He's like, is there not, he bewailing, right? He's like, I demand a blessing. Is there not a blessing left for me it's interesting because he didn't want the birthright the right and responsibility of the promise he didn't want it he rejected it and then he sold out <laughs> he was a sellout okay but even so he did want the blessing though he wanted the divine right to rule please stay with me and write that down the divine right to rule he wanted the blessing from yah he wanted his father to speak the uh, provisional blessings, right? The, the blessings to have the divine right. I'll explain what that means in just a second. But he didn't want the responsibility of carrying the promise. He just wanted to be ordained, he wanted to be great, okay? And so he demands a blessing, but there's nothing for him, okay? So now we're gonna, I'm gonna show you something. It's pretty cool here. Let me close this out. Okay, so um, let's go back here. How come it's not? Oh, okay. Double portion. Let's talk about a double portion. Now, again, a double portion is not something that is really, uh, it's only used, I think, three times in scripture, but it's important here. I want you to see something. We'll see it with Joseph, too. So in Deuteronomy 21, 15, and again, I just, I just want to clarify because double portion has been misinterpreted um, by other people, but we're going to break it down to simplify. So a double portion here found in Deuteronomy 21, 15 speaks of one above, right? One above the other. Um, in this case, it would be kin. Uh, but one who receives a, du a double portion of the father's estate, we know that Yahusha receives a double portion. It's usually something that's given to the least um, or to the lowly or to the dejected one. And so Yahusha was, in fact, the least among uh, his brethren. He was the lowly or the dejected one from his brothers. So he receives a double portion. He inherits the double portion as in heaven and earth. So he already had the inheritance of heaven. He is the darling of heaven. That's what it means, a darling. He is the preferred of heaven. So he has received the uh, um, inheritance of heaven. But now the double portion is that he receives the earth. So he receives both heaven and earth. He becomes the testee of heaven and earth, the inheritor. So Abraham receives his reward from Yahuwah as Yahuwah compensates him for his obedience and his faithfulness. He says that his name will be great. His seed will proliferate within and without, meaning speaking of national and international um, dealings, that he would become the prototype of faith as a seed. So Abraham is actually, even though it's in the natural, we see the spiritual, Abraham is being sown as a seed of faith. He is the seed of faith. He is being sown by faith and by faith will he proliferate. He will become the prototype of faith. He will become the prototype that leads to the fullness that's found in Yahusha. Now, in Deuteronomy 21, 17, and this is speaking of a double portion, the sole purpose of establishing this law or this right ruling is, in my opinion, to prevent nepotism and 
illegitimacy within the pe within the nation of Israel. Reason being is because we see that nepotism actually happens or takes place later on um, in 30 BC while when Yahusha was on the ground. And so they would then through succession, hand their legacy or their title, priests would, or, you know, rulers of the time would hand it over to their nephews or nephews. They would even sell their positions and their seats. And that's nepotism. So Deuteronomy 21, 17, so favoritism, okay, uh, is who ensures the right of the firstborn. He says, if a man has two wives, one beloved and another hated, and they have both borne him a child, the beloved the beloved and the hated. And if the firstborn son, the Bakur, be hers that was hated, then it shall be when he makes his sons to inherit that which he has, that he may not make the son of the beloved firstborn before the son of the hated, the firstborn. But he shall acknowledge, remember that acknowledgement? He shall acknowledge the son of the hated the firstborn by giving him a double portion of all that he has for he is the beginning of his strength the right of the firstborn is his now think of yahusha this is my beloved son in whom i am well pleased he acknowledged him <laughs> the son of the hated he was hated he was despised it says that yahusha was despised okay but yahuwah he's legitimate he's legitimate because yah acknowledges him so he receives a double portion both heaven and earth because yahusha is the beginning of his strength okay he's the the virility he's the this the emblem of his strength he's the it says that he is the image of the invisible right he's the and so he, he takes on that right that status of the firstborn one above this is why in the book of hebrews it says that he is now above the angels in heaven and above all man and all creation on earth He's above all. <laughs> There's only one that's above him. So let's break down some of these words. Let's look at the word acknowledge, okay? So the word acknowledge, again, which is what legitimate, 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 makes someone legitimate, legitimatized. I, I don't know why I can't say the word. So acknowledge is the word nakar, and it means to recognize, to legitimize <laughs> by giving him a portion above his brothers. So he's saying that so that we don't see um, a bunch of illegitimate children out there, um, so that we don't see you favoring because you love this woman. We see that with Rachel and Leah, right? Um, you still have to acknowledge. And the way that you're going to legitimize your son um, is that you're going to give him a double portion. So that's how Yahusha is legitimized as well. Not just by the proclamation or acknowledgement, but by giving him a double portion. And literally, we are called legitimate children as well because we are called a sort of first fruits. I'm going to show it to you. So acknowledge means to recognize, to make legitimate by giving him a portion, by giving him an inheritance above his brothers. Now, remember when that other guy, um, Jehovah, Jehovah, Fah, whatever his name was, who was born of, a, of harlotry, he was not a legitimate son. He was not born of legitimacy. He was born of fornication. So that's why he didn't receive, even though he was able to buy back, uh, negotiate back his status, uh, he still, his line, his lineage did not um, proceed. It did not continue. And it's, it ended with his daughter. So it says that he shall receive a double portion. So the word double here is shenayim. And this is beautiful because it means twofold or to repeat it, okay? To give twice. And then the word portion here is pay. And it always is. Because again, it means of the mouth to say it twice, to say to reiterate. When, when Yahushua says, amen, amen, I say unto you, right? <laughs> amen, amen. So that is a double portion. Amen, amen. So it means to um, to clarify double, uh, to give double, um, measure twice, okay? So portion of the mouth, and we see this is, again, by faith. Faith comes by hearing, hearing by the word of Yahuwah. As the word was given to Abraham, Abraham then passed that on to his son Isaac. Isaac passed it on to Jacob by default. So it means to make a claim from the mouth. That's how we receive it. That's why Yahushua says, my sheep shall hear my voice. Because the claim that he is making is a claim that's made that can only be heard by faith. The flesh cannot hear it. The flesh thinks that Yahushua is foolishness to the point where it would crucify him.
seeing him as a threat in the natural desiring to usurp his position in the natural the flesh so the flesh crucifies him but the spirit the soul of the man who desires truth is in spiritual things receiving the words of life from the mouth okay from the mouth okay out of the heart the mouth speaks so it's to make a claim and so the mouth the mouth will then speak twice in regard to land and inheritance or making reference to these things it is translated as to share or to give divisions or to give portions or to give your part okay so now he says that you shall with your mouth you shall acknowledge him by making proclamations giving him a double proclamation okay and then the second part is the beginning of his strength because that's what he is so again look it's the word Rashith. now remember that jehovah guy he was like let me come back home and and, and maintain my status as the Rashith, as the head or the chief or the first fruit over you make me a leader over you and captain and i'll come back and i'll conquer your enemies and he does so this is yahusha in the beginning was the word well he's saying that the word was chief the word was chief. The word was first. That Yahusha is the head of something. This word Berashith or Rashith or beginning speaks of the first fruit, the Bakur, the beginning of his strength. Okay. It is an emblem or symbol of virility or power. It speaks also of the reign or the kingdom or the rule etc the first son initiates the one that comes breaks the matrix or breaks the womb is the one that initiates the proceeding of the father's estate this is what it means to be established as generative a successor that is the first of many that's what prototikos means prototikos that's what yahusha is called he's called a prototikos as well as progenitor but he's a prototikos he's the first of many in a line of succession many will be patterned prototyped after him he's the prototype like abraham was the prototype of faith he's the prototype of salvation he's the new man he's the one that in the spirit we are patterned after he is the emblem of regenerative power because he was raised from the dead he is the son of regeneration he is the ruler the master the head the chief cornerstone of the kingdom of heaven and over the kingdom of men on the earth all kingdoms all kingdoms he is the chief and he initiated by breaking the matrix of miriam who was a virgin he broke the matrix and thereby becoming the darling or the beloved the firstborn receiving a double portion inheritance and giving that portion not only to those who are in the house internal affairs but also external the gentiles having that double portion to bring salvation to all mankind all those who will enter in by faith who will receive their inheritance which leads to salvation the promise is complete in him it is fulfilled as he initiated the proceedings of his father's estate the father has always intended for us to live and not die the right of procession is that you will regenerate that you will live and the con and, and and be a display be an example and proof of his continuity of his power of his virulence that he is a living l you beloved become the emblem the symbol of that truth and yahusha has indeed come as a result of that to again bring us into that place of victory now watch this in james chapter one oh it says here and this is again proof in john chapter 113 it says that children we become children sons not born not of blood remember you can't inherit this by flesh and blood but we are children born not of blood nor of the desire or will of man but born of yahuwah hallelujah and james 1 18 it says of his own will 
He brought us forth by the word of truth, that we might be a kind of bekor, first fruits of his creatures, patterned after the prototikos, or the first of many, Yahusha. So now we're still looking, we're breaking down Deuteronomy 21, 17 regarding the double portion. And again, to prevent favoritism or nepotism and legitimizing, making legitimate. There's, you cannot, it's not about you above you, above you. You can't earn your way in. It's about, again, the faith. So it says that he is the beginning. He is the successor of his strength. Now, the word here, strength, is this word, one, or one, one. And look again, gen generative power, success, wealth, substance, proof of virility, that a man did not live in vain, or that the work of his hands did not come to nothing. This strength, the strength of the flesh, the arm of the flesh, it is fleeting, beloved, which is why a son bears the hope of continuity. I hope that makes sense. So the reason why a son encourages a man to continue to keep going to labor is because he realizes that what he's doing, he looks at his child, generation, right? Generational wealth, generational. He looks and he says, I live for you right that's the right concept that seeing a son being born says that i have not lived in vain it gives the natural man hope how much more the work of his hands yahusha and what he labored for was not in vain when he returns he returns for a harvest that he might find faith on the earth so again the physical strength, the natural things, they are fleeting. Fleeting. It's deferred hope. But the hope that we have is the eternal hope. That's why the word says Christ in us, the hope of glory. So we look towards the eternal things. Our eyes are not set on the temporal things, again, which is fleeting. Now, finally, he says that he is the beginning of his strength. And it is his right as a firstborn to receive that double portion. So now the word here for right, and this is where we're going to get back to the Zelophehad and all the judges. When I said that the right to rule, that word for right, meaning a verdict or a judgment that is by law, a ordinance or a judgment that is pronounced. Well, this word here, it's the right of the firstborn. What is this right? It's the word mishpat. And it means a verdict pronounced. Pay, literally pay by the mouth, judicially as a decree, an ordinance that justifies the privilege given to an individual by a lawful decision. I know there's a lot of words, but that's what a mishpatim is. That's what a judgment is. It's a verdict pronounced judicially by judges as a decree, a declaration, an ordinance, something that stands to justify something such as a privilege that is given to a certain individual by a decision made within a court of law. Okay, I just broke it all down for you, okay? So now the word mishpat here, it is a legal decision. It is a lawful act. It is a proclamation issued by a head greater than the individual. So for example, when a decree or a mishpat is decreed, by a monarch, it becomes a royal decree, a royal, the, by decree of the king, okay? No one can contest it. And again, this is why the father blesses the son with this mishpat, this verdict, that no one can contest it if the one who's giving is greater. There is no one greater than Yahuwah. That's why he swears by his own name, because there's no one greater than him. No one can contest him. That's why when we put our focus and attention on Satan and the devil and evil that is in the world, you are literally saying in your own world that the enemies and the, that you give power to are worthy opponents. They're not. They are not. There's no one greater than Yahuwah, the creator. Therefore, his decrees, his word, his verdicts, his judgments, his laws, they are superior to all other. And no one can contest them. Sorry, no one can contest him. 
Because he's the chief among all. He's the head. Okay? Royal decree. So this right is given by a head to another. And what happens is, watch this. When this one, the head, bequeaths or gives that verdict to the other, that's the giving the property or the inheritance to the other, the other one by status either becomes equal to the father or greater than the father. You see? And the idea is that the son would go farther, stretch out, multiply, do greater, greater works, right? Greater works. So this is the right of the firstborn. And of course, the word here for firstborn is bakor. And again, we see that a lot. Again, the bakor or the firstborn held certain privileges called the birthright. Okay. He was the primo genitor. Remember Genesis, genitor. He was the first of the generations. He was the regenerated, the first to regenerate and all others would be patterned after him. This word primogenitor in Greek is prototokos, and it's from 4413, protos meaning first or preeminent, and 5088 from tikto meaning to bring forth. So the first horn is the first to bring forth. So when the word was in the beginning, the word was the prototokos or the preeminent that brought forth all of creation. Hallelujah. In Matthew 1 25 and in Luke chapter 2 verse 7, this word preeminent is used as well as in Colossians 1 15 and Revelation chapter 1 verse 5 of Yahusha. Now a firstborn maintains the state or the status of being the firstborn. The right of succession belongs to the firstborn Unless, of course, they forfeit it, some ingredient sin, they lose their right, whatever the case may be, for reasons I mentioned earlier. Now, this is something called the feudal rule by which the whole real estate of an estate passed on to the first son. So the right of succession usually belonged by order and decree, by a law put in motion to the firstborn especially the feudal rule. And that's what Esau wanted. He wanted the feudal rule by which the whole real estate of an interstate, his father, would be passed on to him. But he didn't want the responsibilities of the promise. So it says here that by decree, he shall receive his portion unless it is forfeited. Okay. Now, moving on, we are concluding here in uh, Genesis chapter 27 in, in verse 36. So now Esau is crying out because he lost this. He is no longer going to be the strength of his father. He is not going, the, the, the world, the things will not be patterned after him. He will not become the feudal ruler. He will not inherit the um uh the the wealth the estate of his father watch this in verse 36 esau says speaking of jacob is he not rightly called or named jacob for he has supplanted me these two times first he took my birthright my status and now behold he has taken my blessing the promise so jacob remember jacob becomes the head because of what his father put upon him he is a status above a head above he be, will become a lord or a master over esau as well as over isaac's household he will receive the fatness of isaac's sustenance corn and wine which shows the binding power of words this is why the word says the power of life and death is in the tongue because Oaths back then had imprecations <laughs> they, they by faith, right? Imprecations. 
as people became unbelieving, words no longer held of um, vitality or substance. Uh, but this is why men have become uh, weak in their words. And this is why men have become defeated because they lack faith. So it's not with us. Guess how we will reign in victory. That's why us, we have been given the regenerative power of faith. So that when we speak, we speak life. We have the power of life and death given back to us as part of that inheritance, beloved, the heritage to be fruitful and multiply. May your words be fruitful, the fruit of your tongue, the fruit of your lips. So Esau, he does, he recognizes, he's like, he supplanted me twice. So we see there's two things here. He took my birthright. He took my blessing. Okay. And so Jacob will then become the head. He becomes the master. He has the sustenance or the fatness of Isaac's sustenance. But you notice that that doesn't happen. We'll talk about that next time. But he doesn't actually receive any of the physical inheritance. He does take with him a large entourage from his father's house. But what about the rest of the provisions? He, it doesn't say that he took these things with him. Um, so we're thinking spiritually here of the, the sustenance of the corn and the wine. That is a, a future promise. Again, the fulfillment of that promise being um, the sustenance of life, which shows again the binding power of words or making oaths, which is why Paul says, do not make oaths. Let your yes be yes and your no be no, because life and death are in these words, blessings and curses. Okay, so blessings. So Esau does receive a portion. His portion that he receives from his father is proportional to the prophecy that was given to Rebekah. And remember in Genesis 25, 23, Yahweh declares to Rebekah, two nations are in your womb and two peoples from within you shall be separated. One people will be stronger than the other and the older will serve the younger. Remember he says two nations will be scattered, divided against each other and they will not mix. So this is what happens. Isaac, without knowing, blesses Jacob and does in fact fulfill the prophecy spoken to Rebekah. We see that prophecy also being fulfilled later on throughout the course of time as Esau rises up, removes the yoke from off of his neck. It says here that um, verse 39, 40, that Esau, he tell, this is what he blesses Esau with. Check this out. This is profound. He tells Esau, behold, your dwelling because he says, give me something. He says, okay, behold, your dwelling shall be the fatness of the earth and the dew of heaven above. Okay. And the rain substance. And by your, but he says, by your sword, you will be a man of war. By your sword shall you live and you shall serve your brother. He says, and it shall come to pass. There shall come to pass a time when you will become restless and throw off his yoke. So Esau hates Jacob and determines to kill him. So, so Rebecca sends him away again to, pro, to, to protect him. But here's what's interesting. I want you to notice something. It's got to catch it, right? This means that the blessing that, again, powerful, the blessing that Jacob cares about, that Jacob receives, is the promise that was given to Abraham by Yahuwah. Jacob wants it. Jacob wants that. Ooh, watch this. When Isaac blesses Jacob, thinking he's Esau. The blessing that he gives to him is that may Yahuwah make you strong. May Yahuwah give you the dew of him. May Yahuwah do this for you. May Yahuwah, may Yahuwah. He gives the blessings of Yahuwah and puts them upon him. But when he gives Esau the blessing, he doesn't. He just says, well, May your dwelling be full of fatness of the earth and may the dew of heaven from above and may you're going to live by the sword and you're going to serve your brother and it'll come to pass. You'll eventually break his yoke and you're going to be restless. And, but it's not by, it's not the provision of Yahuwah. So he receives man's blessing, but not Yah's blessing. Powerful. All right, let's finish up here. The divine right to rule. What is the divine right to rule? So this is what he wants, that feudal rule. Esau and all the flesh wants the divine right to rule. So speaking of kings, this is what it is. Pretty powerful. Do some research. Divine right to rule or also called the divine right of kings. And it's actually in, in uh, effect even now in, in Europe. So it's asserting, listen to this, 
that a monarch is subject to no earthly authority, the head of heads, the king of kings, okay, deriving his right to rule directly from the will of God. Okay, these are my little notes to find rule. So this is a thing. This is a real thing. Okay. This is Yah's like, yes, yes. I give the divine right to rule. Yes, I do. And this is what Satan wants. Ultimately, he wants to somehow through succession, uh, through genealogies and bloodlines and the color of one's skin and all the things he made up. <laughs> he wants to give the, um, appearance of one who has a divine right to rule, which ultimately breaks down to anointing. So this is why the anti-Messiah or the um, one who does not have the right to rule will try to rise up as one who has a divine right to rule. This is important. So it speaks of kings. Again, it's basically saying, and you Google it, okay? The divine right to rule, Google it. Monarch, it's saying that I am subject to no earthly authority. No one can judge me right? Because my right to rule comes directly from God. This is why pagan nations created mythology and all these other gods, right? Because they said by the God of Diana or by the God of Marduk or whatever, their Dagon or whoever they worship, Zeus, I have the right to rule in his seed. I am his Bekor. I am his darling or his beloved in which I am the strength and the virility. I display the strength and the virility of my God. But there are no other gods. So they were literally the arm of the flesh only, which is why they constantly gave themselves over to fear tactics, manipulation, seduction, uh, distractions. They ruled with a violence and tyranny and horrible, right? Which, by the way, a righteous ruler at the conclusion of all things, it says the meek shall inherit the earth. The meek. Because they know how to resolve conflict without, you know what I mean? They're not going to be like, what? Rising up. How dare? Ego, 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 you know, egocentric. You know, they're not ego driven. Oh, gosh. I can't wait till we just keep going. Okay. So watch this. So the divine right to you can't judge me. Watch this. We have this right. We have this right in which we can say to the rest of the world, you can't judge me. No one can judge me. Does it sound arrogant? It does, but it's not. It's a right. First Corinthians chapter 2, 14 through 16. So the natural man, though, the natural man is already condemned, judged, <laughs> sentenced to death. Like what? Forget about it. Don't even try. <laughs> Come on out of there. <laughs> Give me a second. The natural man does not accept the things that come from the spirit of Elohim, for they are foolishness to him, and he cannot understand them because they are spiritually discerned, can hear, they can't receive by faith, right? Like Esau, he was a natural man, a hunter of flesh, all the things, he was natural. So he could not understand the spiritual things, but Jacob did. He was learned in the tents. But the spiritual man, what does he do? It says the spiritual man judges all things. He's a judge, but he himself is not subject to anyone's judgment. Why? Because he has the mind of Mashiach. It says here, for who has known the mind of the creator? so as to instruct him. We have the mind of Mashiach. We have the mind of Mashiach. Who can instruct the creator? No one, because there is no one above him. He has the divine right to rule. <laughs> there is no authority above him. There's no one greater to contest him, to overthrow him. That's why there are... But make it Satan. There was a battle in the Zulala. What in your world? I feel sorry for those people who propagate these the lies, the devil lies, the lies you tell. They're lying to you. He doesn't have the power that he is manipulating people into believing that he does. Not in my world. Okay. If he wants to remain a villain with great power and assets in your world, that's your choice. In my world, not so. In my world, Yahuwah is victor. He is greater than all other. 
The power that is working in me is greater than the power that is in this world. Witches, sorcery, devils, demons. What? Not in my world. <laughs> Not anymore. I remember just really quick side note here. When I was, my dad was alive. I don't know if you remember that commercial. It was some basketball player. And he was really big and he spoke funny. And it was a commercial for Snickers. And he was bouncing the ball. And then the kid would try to throw the thing and he would block it. He'd say, not in my house. <laughs> not today. No, no, no. Well, it's so funny because my dad used to go around saying all the time to me, Jessica. And I'd be like, yeah. And he's like, not in my house. Not today. No, no, no. And I would start laughing. It was so weird. Do you know that that comes to my mind all the time when I start to give myself over to the lies of my flesh, weakness of my flesh, when Satan comes in to tempt me or to take advantage of my weakness or to try to overthrow me? My father's voice will come into my mind, my head, and I'll say, I'll hear him saying, not in my house, not today. No, no, no. I know that's really funny, but side note, I just, and I start laughing and I'm just like, it's that simple. Resist the devil and he flees. He flee he runs from you. The natural man is judged, but the spiritual man is not. Do you know why? Because the spiritual man has the spirit of Elohim, has the mind, wisdom of Elohim. You have the spirit of Elohim working in you, giving you wisdom to judge matters rightly. Okay, to resolve conflict without sinning, to have a righteous indignation and anger without sinning, so that you're not given over to violence and brutal force, so that you have a spirit of meekness and humility versus haughtiness and pride, so that you're not giving yourself over to the lusts of your flesh, but it's rather the simplicity of wisdom that governs you. As a result, you have the divine right to rule. The installation, the giving of the Ruach is the installment of this right. That's what it means to be installed. It means to receive that divine right, that law in effect, that ordinance, that rule by which it cannot be contested because it becomes a royal decree. It becomes a decree by which the one who decreed it there is no one greater, okay? You can't contest it. It's immovable. It's established. So the right to rule is this. The force, which again is the Ruach, or operation of law, the spirit of the law at work in the life of a dead. This is literally the definition. <laughs> the force or operation of life at work in the life of of a designated person, which would later be known as an anointed, chosen, called, anointed person, expected to represent the head above him, the rule, the reign, to take the lead, to govern all the responsibilities in the steed of his father or the previous head of the domain that he's inheriting. The domain is also the house or the dominion so this obviously requires territory or land with provisions and possessions, which is again why I encourage you to start expecting, anticipate dominion, provisions. Land. He's not going to give it to you though if you're still, be, you know, wrestling with your flesh. Why your house has to be in order. Okay. So the idea is that a designated person, an anointed person, is the one that has expectations are on him. There's a something resting on his shoulders. An expectation that he's going to represent the one before him. He's going to represent the chief above him. He's going to represent his rule, his reign. He's going to lead in his steed. He's going to govern according to his previous owner's ways. He's going to be the master of the house, even his father, and do greater than that. He's, okay, so that's what it means. We actually, Yahusha designates us as ambassadors. 
That's what it ultimately means. It means that we become ambassadors, representatives. So uh, while we're temporarily here on earth, this is the force of operation. This is why the Ruach has been given to us so we can walk accordingly, so that we can conduct ourselves in our daily lives according to the ways of the Ruach, the right ruling with wisdom and understanding, being motivated by love to overthrow the works of darkness. That is the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eye and the pride of life so that we can function harmoniously so that we can prove the virility of our king we have it in us the time is now done now in genesis again to rule if you want to rule over anything first thing you got to know how to do is rule over sin and yes you can because again yahushua finished it he made it so that we can govern by power of intestation uh, intestate um, by power of that will being passed over to us, crossing over by faith, receiving our inheritance, receiving the gift of the Ruach as a seal or a token or ratification of the covenant, we now have that power in us to do exactly what Yahushua was capable of. He is capable, okay? He is a, 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 a omnipotent, okay? So in Genesis 4, 7, when the first thing, going all the way back from the beginning, when Yah deals with Cain, he says, sin is at the door crouching. Rule over it. Rule. Rule over sin. We have been given the power. The word tells us, actually, I forgot the verse here, but the word says, I have not given to you a spirit of fear, but the Ruach of power, to work in love and self-control. Truly, you know that you're being primed to rule, to govern. When you ultimately execute power and authority by the force of love and you display self-control, when you can govern your mouth and your, your bodily actions, self-control is the ultimate, ultimate display of government, perfect government. Control yourself, control yourself. This can only be truly, we can we can see poor examples of self-control, which is like mind over matter or whatever. But again, those are fraudulent, those are pseudo. And the only ones that can truly exhibit self-control in power and in love are those who have been, who have received the Ruach of Elohim. All right, let's finish. So, conclusion, Jacob is sanctioned, look up the word sanctioned, he's sanctioned as a designated person, Yahuwah designates him, he sanctions him to maintain the heritage or the promise of faith, that promise that comes by faith, he is blessed of Yahuwah, Esau is not. One thing in regard to masters and rulers, okay? Masters and rulers, and I don't know if slave and master here. Yeah, masters and ruler. I had a lot more, but I'm just going to close with this. That's it. Um, masters and rulers. So the role of the monarch. Okay, hold on. The role of the monarch. Where are we? The role of the monarch. Remember the king, the head of the house, the leader, the whatever i'm going to break it down so the role of the leader or the monarch ultimately the master or the king was to maintain peace of the realms peace within the realms all the realms okay peace and to oversee the administration of justice and to uphold the law that's ultimately his responsibility or the role now a king this is really funny but judges governed before the monarchy, before the Davidic monarchy or Saul's monarchy. But the king usually was just it's pretty much the emblem or the symbol, the seat of power, right? This is why they had all this regalia. But the king was the emblem of power and authority. So as the king prospered, the people were also expected to prosper if he was a good king, okay? In 2 Timothy 1 7, oh, well, here's the verse. 2 Timothy 1 7 says, For Yahuwah has not given us a spirit of fear, but of power, love, and self control, and even a sound mind, right? Having the mind of Mashiach. 
So the king, again, that's the, the responsibility as a national leader. But speaking on a smaller scale for those of you who are in positions of leadership or influence or even husbands, to be the head of something means that you have been established. We see this nationally, but familial with over the family dynamic. You are established so that you can become the emblem that is the identity, the unity, the stability, and the continuity of the household. That's a lot of responsibility. That's why love is the motivating factor. It says husbands love your wives. Because when you love properly, when you have that motivating force, that uh, force of operation, love being the force that operates in you, which is the law, that's the spirit of the law. When it's at work in your life, you become the designated, the head is anointed, you're anointed, and you are then expected to represent your king, your covering, your head, Yahusha. You then are able to love your wife as Yahusha loved the, the assembly. Strive for love, not leadership. When you are perfected in love, leadership will come naturally. You will be motivated by this power, by this rule. You want to control something? Control yourself. You want to rule over someone? Rule over sin, okay? But as the king, again, or as the head or the monarch or the leader of the house, the adon, the master... Your responsibility is to oversee, to administer justice, to uphold the law, to maintain peace by your conduct, by your right ruling, to be governed not by a spirit of cowardice or fear, but of power, courage, love, and self-control, to establish the familial identity, to establish unity amongst your neighbors, your brethren, to bring stability to the community as a whole, not with unstable actions, lust, and giving yourselves over to wind of doctrines all confused, but to be a stable pillar, a source of strength, and to maintain continuity. Yahusha gives this to all of his people, both male and female, as we are called to work together, a woman being a helpmate the master of the house. She receives also the status of a wife as he receives the status of a husband. If she, if he didn't have a wife or children, he would never be able to have them. Who would he master? <laughs> Who would he rule over? There'd be no sons and no daughters and no wives. If it was just a single source, he would never have the status of a master. Who would he master? Who would he rule over? Himself. <laughs> well, I guess he could have the master of the house. He would master his own house. But you see what I'm saying. So Yahoo has given to him a heritage blessing, wives and children, a wife and children. He has given to him gifts so that he can rule over them in love, so that he can help maintain the continuity of the heritage of the saints, to be fruitful, to multiply, to flourish in his midst, to flourish within his gates. It seems like a huge responsibility, but this is why Yahweh has given to you women, a helpmate, to encourage you, to help you. We are told that we should be the head and not the tail. In Deuteronomy 28, 44, that means the lender and not the borrower. That because it has to do with a lender is somebody who is free. A borrower is somebody who is indebted. They put themselves in debt. They become slaves until that's paid off. So the head means one who is free. We are, the word says that we are blessed coming in and blessed going out. That speaks of national and international trade. But on a simpler level, it means the way that you conduct yourselves with your brethren, how you trade with them, how you deal with them, how you work with others. Blessed coming in, blessed going out. When you go to work, you're blessed. When you come home, you're blessed. And in Isaiah 
we see conclude con what, what it really looks like the words the pay the words of the wise nobles are the head okay and the prophet that teaches lies he's the tail so again, this concludes with genesis back in the beginning right the words of the wise these are the head and yet this this prophet this this entity that was in the garden spoke lies it really is about truth and lie working in mankind yah is not concerned about the um uh the uh heralder of lies he's already defeated you get that right like the fact that he's working within a realm of darkness tells us that he is defeated easily defeated by that easily turn on the light easily everything else is speculation the problem that's being worked out here is yah's grace to be patient with mankind what he's working out is our salvation he's preparing us to enter in to the rule and reign to truly walk with him in whatever eternity is i'm gonna read something um luke boy we're done yes we're done truly truly we're done let me um i, I keep getting like these little uh, glitches um what am i trying to do here share my screen thank you let me share my screen we're gonna read something this is really cool that's it we're done luke 12 13 20 if you have any questions you can post them look at three hours we're, we did good uh you can post them in the chat and we can talk about them yes in conclusion i, I was thinking of you maura uh when i said yes i'm really done okay let's read this uh luke 12 and we'll see what we're we'll summarize everything and i hope you appreciate all that this is what was given up right Esau will never be. And this is really going to set the foundation as we continue to read through this way. Uh, we're going to see uh, over and over and over again that, again, it's just pointing to Yahusha. But what, so why do we need to, okay, yeah, Yahusha did all these things. But what, what Yah really wants us to know from all of this is who we are. <laughs> what have we inherited? I remember a long time ago, uh, the, I used to be like, one day I'm going to do like a full-on search of all the promises, the blessings that we inherit. Well, that's what we're doing uh we're concluding he's giving it to it's our harvest season right it's our harvest season and the spirit is flourishing in us the spirit is proliferating it is uh it is um producing in us right all right let's look at this so um okay here we go the parable of the rich fool and what now again you're going to start to see it everywhere you can't unsee it now all the pre primogenitor the bakur the inheritance the first all you're going to start to see it all the covenant so it says and one of the company said unto him master why is it saying master right speak to my brother that he divide the inheritance with me see that and he said unto him Yahusha, man, <laughs> look at this. Who made me a judge or a divider over you? And he said unto them, this to the rest of the people, take heed and beware, what? Of covetousness, covetousness. For a man's life consists not in the abundance of the things which he possesses, physical things, and then he spoke a parable unto them saying, the ground of a certain rich man brought forth plentiful. And he thought within himself saying, what shall I do because I have no room where to bestow my fruits? And he said, this will I do. I will put down my barns and build greater. And there will I bestow all of my fruits and my goods. I will store them up. And I will say to my soul, soul, you have much goods laid up for many years. Take thine ease, eat, drink, be merry. <laughs> 
But Elohim said unto him, you fool, this night your soul shall be required of you. <laughs> what did I say? What was it called? Distraint. It will be required of you. Your soul will be required for payment. Death comes to seize your soul for payment. Because guess what? You are in forfeit. Everything that you have, you still can't pay off the debt. You're poor, indigent, wretched. He says, but you fool, this night your soul shall be required, demanded. That's part of the restraint, okay? I assure you. Dem look at right here. Ask back, to demand back. Okay. Ooh. To recall a legal exaction of a demand or a legitimate claim. Now you're going to start to see it everywhere now that our eyes are being opened. To require, okay, look at this. To require or ask again, our master teaches here that it is better to be master of your emotions than your possessions. <laughs> to require or to demand again, they required your soul. The phrase they require must be understood as a reference to three persons. Oh, I want to get into that. But life must be viewed as a loan from Elohim due to be returned to him at death. To seek, to seize, seizure, inquire, desire, to see after, right? So we see again, let's see if there's a, oh, let me see something here. Same, just to ask back. It governs the general and expresses what is strictly the idea, a person or object to be formally, that was previously separated, dismissed from a husband, divorced, to be brought back. Ooh, oh my goodness, I need to look at this apple right here. I need to look at that. Okay, so moving on. So he's saying then there shall be a distraint upon you you have all this you required but you can't be you can't pay off your debt so he says that uh, it shall be required of you when uh of the then whose shall those things be which you have provided so he that lays up treasure for himself and is not rich towards elohim see and he said unto his disciples therefore i say unto you take no thought for your life what you shall eat, neither for the body, what you shall put on. The life is more than meat and the body more than raiment. Consider the ravens, for they neither sow nor reap, which neither have storehouse nor barn. And Elohim feeds them. How much more are you better than the fowls? And which of you, with taking thought, can add to his stature one cubit, a head above? If you then be not able to do these things, which is least, why do you take thought for the rest? Consider the lilies, how they grow. They toil not, they spin not. And yet I say unto you that Solomon in all of his glory was not arrayed like one of these. If then Elohim so clothed the grass, which is today in the field and tomorrow is cast even into the oven, how much more will he clothe you, O of little faith? And seek not ye what you will eat or drink, neither be ye of doubtful mind. For all these things do the nations of the world seek after. And your father knows that you have need of these things, but rather seek ye the kingdom of Elohim, and all these things shall be added unto you. Fear not, little flock, for it is your father's good pleasure to give you the kingdom. Sell all that you have and give alms, provide yourselves bags which wax not old, a treasure in the heavens that faileth not where no thief approaches, neither moth corrupts. For where your treasure is, there will your heart be also. Let me say one more thing. So in verse 30, what does he say? 
He says, do not live for food or drink, Esau. Food or drink. For the nations seek after such things. Instead, we are admonished to seek the kingdom of heaven. Well, in Philippians, check this out. You got to see this. Super cool. Let me in philippians 3:19 oh philemo in philippians 3:19 it says for many walk well try 18 for many walk of whom i told you often and now tell you even weeping as enemies of the cross whose end is destruction God is their belly, their appetite, and whose glory is their shame, who mind after earthly things. Remember that word where he says to Abraham and then also to um, Sarah, the mie, right, I'm sorry, no, to Rebecca, the mie, the, the womb, the womb right the womb of destruction or the womb of mercy the womb the chesed the rachem the womb of mercy or the womb of destruction we yahusha came from the womb of mercy he is the rachem the compassion of yah again showing us that through the regenerative seed that the seed that life will continue the death is not the end the destruction is not his will for us that he has indeed given us the hope of glory the hope not of shame to be put to shame but to be glorified in the day of his coming there's also something else i wanted to um read you let's see if i can get this last one since we're just on um borrowed time here Oh my gosh, am I all red? I am. I don't know. I feel like I'm, I'm I don't know, hives or something. <laughs> Look it. I don't know what's happening. I think I'm hot. <laughs> Help. <laughs> okay, so let's talk about something really quick. Family, the head. Okay. Now this is um, coming from the Hammurabi codes, codes and various other ancient Near Eastern codexes prior to the giving of the Torah. But again, these were laws that were instituted by the, the genetic composure, no, the genetic, the gen, I don't know, the, the, way, the way that Yah created man. That's why he says that the Gentiles who uh, do things that are right before Yah prove that there is a law working in them. So like there's a law that's working in them from the beginning because Yah created them that way um, to be in his image and his likeness. So they have it in them to govern properly. But again, as I said, the more and more that mankind has given themselves over to the lasciviousness of their flesh, the covetousness of their flesh, the weakness of the flesh, it is then governed by the principles of nothingness, the principles of death and destruction. It's all vanity. The wind, the wind becomes uh, monstrous. The wind uh, becomes the devastator. So, um, the, the flesh. And so as a result, the flesh no longer has the faculty of wisdom. It no longer is able to then uh, know the difference between good and evil, right and wrong. And it's handing, mm -hmm. itself, handing itself over to destruction. So, but back then, uh, the family, um, these are terms where the authority of a head of household, I wanted to give this to you guys, the head of household. So the authority of the head of household uh, was usually one who ruled over the members of the family, uh, thereby he received uh, the, the authority, and in some cases this was um, analogous to those of a property owner so he had a type of power or authority that was uh, analogous to a, a property owner because of the term possession so the head of a house or the authority of the household and the master of the house would have counted his family his wife his children his slaves all of it as his possessions as a telly or his property in which he owned the idea right ruling the way that yahoo has put it in man's heart is that he would perceive all of his possessions as 
his responsibility, then taking on that great responsibility of his conduct and how he conducts himself towards them, recognizing that if Yah has given him, bestowed these blessings, which is provision, companions, children, again, being part of the heritage blessing, if he gives tribute to Yahuwah as the source of these things, then he's accountable to him. So how he conducts, how he treats these people, how he treats those who are under his, his hegemony, he knows that he's responsible. I'm going to give you an example about that divine right to rule. So the, remember it says that no man can judge the individual who's being, who's being um, allotted the power to rule by something greater than him. So in other words, if you come to judge that person, if he's truly uh, installed or designated by something greater, then you would say, you know what, you got to talk to the boss. I'm just doing what I'm told. That's how it works, right? I don't know, you may not like it, but I don't make the rules here, right? So you have to go above him. You have to go to the Supreme Court, okay? So this is perfect example when David sins, when King David sins against, uh, um, what's his name? Um, Uriah. He sins against the man and then he has him, you know, put in a posi position in which, you know, it ends his life. When the prophet comes, Nathan comes to him and tells him, you know, you have sinned and he, he rebukes him because you couldn't rebuke a king. Remember, no one, no one, no earthly man could judge. So he speaks in a parable and he basically judges himself. You, you got to see this. So he gives him this parable and asks him the question, thereby getting him to judge himself. This is what they were trying to do to Yahusha when they were asking him, oh, the king and the taxes and getting him to make a judgment against himself. It was called self-imprecating, right? Imprecation, bringing upon himself his own judgment or his own curse. So when he tells King David, blah, 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 what would you do? He imprecates the judgment. And so he puts it upon himself. He brings guilt. He judges himself. And then he tells him, well, you're that guy. And he's like, ah, <laughs> right? Because again, no, what, no earthly ruler could, could, could judge him. When he goes to repent, he says, I, I take accountability. Oh, it's such a beautiful thing. You should see the words of David. Go back now and try to understand how David is, is rectifying this. He says, unto Yahuwah, I have sinned against none but you. I have sinned against you, my Elohim. He recognizes the divine right to rule means that only Yahuwah can judge him, that Yah will judge him, that Yah will deal with him. And he he cries out for mercy. You know, he recognizes that he has offended his head, that he has uncovered his head, that he has brought, uncovering means shame, that he has brought his head to shame by coming out from his covering, that he has brought his head to shame, that he has brought shame upon the name of his great master. So it's, again, beautiful, a beautiful concept of responsibility and accountability, which, again, was something the man should have had in the garden, that sense of accountability that he was responsible for the woman and for all of creation that was placed, you know, under his care. Um, it doesn't mean to rule with a heavy hand. A right ruler has a spirit of meekness, um, is able to rule without violence, um, is able to uh, rule with the, uh, again, with the heart of the father in mind. And so back to the family, the head of the household, um, back then, the, they were considered part of the property or the possession of the master, which is why a daughter or a son could be sold uh, into slavery or bartered into slavery and temporarily um, could be put by pledge under uh, the uh, rule of another master. Um, and we'll get into that when we talk about slavery. So, but in the wicked nations, they would sell their children uh, or, or sell them out of, to hire uh, for their labor, um, or he could hand over his wife, not in the Torah, but these uh, other covenant nations would, within covenants, hand over their wives or children by way of pledge to secure a debt for him. Isn't that unfortunate? Like, he's like, I'm in debt, but I'm going to send my wife over. <laughs> oh, but there's all sorts of loopholes. But anyways, so a son owned no property while his father was alive it was his father's and a wife's dowry 
was subsumed uh, into the marital assets that were controlled by her husband. We see that with Leah and Rachel as the father is spending their dowry. Now, on the other hand, this is uh, an area where there is differences uh, because the husband, even though he's called the master of his wife or his children, neither his wife or children were ever referred to as slaves of the head of the household. And again, I bring that up. So basically, um, we know that a son had a vested interest in the father's property of which he could not be divested, okay? except for cause and by a court order. And that's when we see that he could forfeit it or by sin. And this is really why Yahuwah puts or initiates the do's and the don'ts of sin or the law. It is in order to make sure that those who inherit the promise um, are those who um, desire to do what is right um, so that the flesh is not able to inherit it. So in addition, if a father chose to allot his son his share in the father's lifetime, the son became present owner of that property and did not lose his status as a son. Very interesting. So I bring that up um, because, uh, again, even though the master of the husband was the wife, he was the master of his wife and children, they were not slaves to the master and that brings us back to that possession or provision, the gift. He possessed them. And anything that he possessed was always supposed to be, again, for the continuity of the family, um, to ensure the continuity of the family. And so uh, it was never to lord over them uh, with a heavy hand or uh, to display violence. In fact, we're going to see that um, all throughout, Yah shows us the gentle hand of, of David, or even though he was a mighty man of war, um, he was valiant. He defended, he defended the household. He defended the house. He defended uh, what Yahuwah had given to him um, as a responsibility. He defended it. Uh, in fact, we see that's the same with all those that Yahu, Yahuwah called uh, to stand um, against the foreign invasions, uh, those who would um, desire to enter in by way of weakness uh, and create inroads in order to overthrow the government of Yah's people and therefore hijack the right to rule. But again, the divine right to rule is basically something that only Yahuwah uh, could designate. He has to install, and again, this would become synonymous with anointing, the anointing. So we know that Yahusha is the final. There should be no other. We will rule and reign with him um, in what is known as the millennial rule. Praise Yah. That's what I'm being prepared for. I know it because hello, I'm talking about these things, but hopefully that's what you're being prepared for too that we're going to rule and reign uh, with him. And it's so funny because those who are like, she's a woman, she can't. Well, I'm just, I'll see you there, okay? We'll see. We'll see when we get into the millennium. I'm going to be at the gate checking your stamps and your passports. I'm going to be like, let me see your cards. Um, because again, it's not about man or woman, uh, Greek or Gentile. It's not about status, rich or poor, master or servant. Um, the inheritance is given to all. And it's about right ruling. It's about those who, desire to be governed by the Ruach. And uh, again, well, he will display his glory to whomever he chooses. So I bring those things up because I think we want to change our mind about the way that we see one another and our responsibilities. Um, I'm also putting together, as I'm putting a lot of different uh, presentations together, aspects of all of this to answer a lot of the things that are you know, questions that are perhaps uh, leading to um, misunderstandings, but also like women's rights in the ancient Near East. Um, Yah was an El of justice and um, he, he cared for the widow and the orphan. That was his primary concern um, was those who were weak and those who were without, that they, they would not remain deficient, uh, but rather that uh, he would always have within his uh, company a people who um, cared for and nourished uh, even when uh, life was fleeting or failing. Uh, but with all that being said, I think that's pretty much the end. Ta-da! Any questions or comments? I would like to interact with you.
All right. That's right. We are preparing for that. Yes. Hallelujah. Especially Dan <laughs> being a ruler and a judge. Hey, let's talk about something else. I'll give you guys something else to consider. So um, before we go, well, maybe we should just log off now because I'm ahead of the game. Yeah, I think we will. Okay. I don't see any questions or comments. Um, so I, I'm just going to let you guys go and we'll talk about Elohims later. We'll talk about judges and Elohims and right rulings and the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. It's really, really simple. Um, I'll see you when I see you. I'm going to go get some rest. Yeah, I'll be with you all. Um, okay. Shalom. <laughs>